so I do notice that it's uh, 8 30. Uh, my name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and we're going to get started. Um, just want to say that today is the first of five days over the next two weeks of hospital budget hearings, and this is an unprecedented year of uncertainty where there are more questions than answers, and um, it, it will be a difficult process and one that um, we hope that to all get through with, with making the correct decisions, whatever they may be. Um, so with that, I'm going to start out by um, offering um, the mic to Jeff Tiemann for some introductory comments about the hospital budgets. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Um, great to be here as we start the hospital budget cycle. This is my fifth um, budget cycle as CEO of the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, which of course represents our state's entire network of not-for-profit hospitals. Um, as Kevin just pointed out, each year brings interesting challenges and narratives to this process for both hospitals and the Green Mountain Care Board. But this year clearly presents the most unique, most unexpected, and most perilous budgets that hospitals have prepared in my time and I imagine in their predecessor's time. The budgets themselves and the presentations that you'll hear over the coming days I think are powerful and important testimonials to a few really important themes. First, the quality of care and commitment to change. You will hear how hospitals have continually worked to invest in reform, understand the specific need for health care in their communities, and adapt programs and services to meet that need in a challenging rural environment while also investing in reform. Second, you'll hear about stewardship and financial management, how hospitals have worked hard to contain expense growth, squeeze out costs, and seek economies of scale, even as inflation outpaces their revenue growth and regulation limits their maneuvering room. And third, you will hear about their response to the COVID-19 global pandemic. You'll hear about how hospitals have led our state's successful response. I know I may be a broken record on this, but I will continue to be. Hospitals work in partnership with state officials, with local communities, and across the healthcare continuum is literally the envy of the nation. The work to respond to and manage the pandemic, and even more importantly, to prepare for the next wave, is complex and profound, and it involves many, many elements, including, to name just a few, setting up drive-up testing facilities and other staffing resources around the need for testing cross-training staff to meet the evolving need of facilities, making rapid adjustments to physical plants, including emergency departments and even parking lots, securing additional beds and creating surge capacity, managing transfers to nursing homes and to mental health providers, obtaining PPE, which was scarce and is now expensive and unpredictable, coordinating the distribution of critical drugs and supplies, and last but not least, providing critical updated information to the public and being a resource to the Vermont Department of Health. With this set of issues before them every day and night, hospital leadership manage incident command in their own facilities and join three times per week calls at VAS to coordinate with their peers throughout the state. Having helped lead those calls, I can tell you that the work was fast and intense and difficult, and it still is, and involves the most important of human consequences. I could not be more proud of the group of people who you will hear from over the coming two weeks for the work they did and continue to do every day on behalf of Vermonters. Way before COVID, I advised the Green Mountain Care Board many times that part of a hospital's everyday responsibility is to prepare for a mass casualty event, a public health crisis, or other unexpected threat that requires a rapid and thoughtful and well-resourced response. Now we know how serious and life-saving that work really is. We have seen it firsthand. We've seen the leadership, not just in our hospitals, of course, but also from our state leaders, Governor Scott, Secretary Mike Smith, Dr. Levine, and so many others that have together made Vermont so successful in terms of our infection rate and adopting the right policies at the right time and enforcing them in the right way. So with that backdrop, I would ask of you as regulators today two things on behalf of the hospitals my association represents. First, consider the overall health of our system and its ability to meet the needs of Vermonters, 
As I have also said many times, I think one of your obligations is to first do no harm. Never has that been more important than now. Hospitals need to be strong and healthy to handle COVID-19 outbreaks and events. Please do not diminish their ability to respond and to be properly resourced. Such a move would harm not just hospitals, but Vermonters. And second, please evaluate each hospital request in the context of this new environment. Yes, we do have the same priorities as before, better care at a lower cost. But we also need to consider that budgets are still subject to significant change and uncertainty, including lost revenues, new expenses, staffing shortages, drug costs, and all the other factors that together make this cycle like no other. As always, I really appreciate the opportunity to provide these remarks and offer some context before the hearings begin. Our hospitals have a lot of important information to share about the care they deliver every day, the heroic work they do to save lives and make life better for others, and the amazing, often superhuman efforts they have undertaken in recent months to keep Vermont as safe and healthy as possible for all of us. I want our hospitals to remain strong and vibrant and focused on the right things, and I know you do too. Thanks for listening over the next two weeks, and thanks for giving me the time this morning. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Susan, did you want to make some introductory remarks? Uh, just some reminders. Um, first of all, the public comment period for the hospital budgets uh, started August 14th. It goes until August 31st, uh, with the reminder that we do take public comment 24-7, 365 days a year, but we would like those comments in before the 31st to be considered with these decisions. Um, as folks are presenting, if you could use the slide number because uh, folks on the line might be using our website to go through the slides, that would be helpful. Um, the materials for the hospital budgets, the narratives, the slides, et cetera, are under, um, they're on our website under FY 2021 budget. So on the left-hand side of the page, you'll see hospital budget review, and you're gonna wanna click on FY 2021 budget. Reach out to Abigail if you ha are having difficulty finding those materials. And then last but not least, um, Abigail did publish a message. I don't see it on the chat right now. Maybe Abigail, you can republish that. Um, we are, we want to make sure that folks know that you cannot use the chat function as a public comment. We request that you either verbally share the public comment or send that public comment to the Green Mountain Care Board public comment webpage. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. Um, and thank you for mentioning, I was gonna ask everyone to refrain from using the uh, chat comment, so that's that's a very good thing. There will be a, a period for public comment later. Uh, Claudio, um, how many witnesses will you have? Uh, two, myself and Judy Fox, our CFO. Kim, if you could swear them in. Good morning. <clears throat> Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. And would you please both just state your names for the record? Judy Fox. Claudio Ford. Thank you. And whenever you're ready, Claudio, you, you may begin. Okay, I am going to present... Um, can everybody see this presentation? We can. You can or can't? Can. Oh, can. Okay, great. Well, Abigail um, uh, briefed us well as she was preparing us for this unique type of uh, meeting. Um, I will tell you, uh, I also tried to grill uh, Abigail to find out really why is Rutland Regional uh, the first budget presentation. Is it because we're kind of the fluffy warm-up act uh, or are you eating your broccoli first and we're gonna have some challenges? So I, I guess the next hour or so we'll, uh, we'll bear that out. But I will tell you, Abby was, uh, Abigail uh, was a steel trap. We didn't get anything from her. So, um, so anyway, uh, here we have uh, this morning myself, 
I'm the president and CEO at, at uh, Rutland Regional Medical Center. Um, this is my third budget presentation on behalf of Rutland Regional. Um, prior to that, I was 10 years at North Country Hospital in Newport. And uh, as we said with me, Judy Fox, our chief financial officer, who has done an exceptional job, her and her team, trying to figure out and uh, guide us through the COVID crisis to literally keep the doors open and keep the lights on here, and to also try to figure out um, what our budget is and how we're going to navigate through this coming year. Uh, with us also on the line, and again, I don't know exactly uh, who we have, but we have um, members of our board of uh, directors, and we have members of our executive um, leadership team and others from the hospital who we've invited to join us. So as uh, most of you know, you've uh, been through this before and you've heard our story, Rutland Regional, we are an independent, not-for-profit community hospital. We're the second largest hospital in Vermont. We serve uh, an area in the south, um, southern part of Vermont that um, encompasses 60,000 patients. Uh, we're a full service community hospital. We have 144 inpatient beds. We have um, uh, a 12 bed intensive care unit, step down units, um, a very active emergency department, uh, one of the second largest ED in the state. Um, we have uh, a little bit less than 1,721 employees. We'll talk to you about some of the cost cutting we've um, unfortunately had to do over this uh, past uh, spring. Um, and we have a full um, complement of medical staff. Um, we are proud that Rutland Regional has um, always stuck to the knitting and focused on the things that matter, our employees, our patients, our quality of care, satisfaction, and the providers who deliver that care. And as you can see, we've realized a number of national awards and recognition for the quality of our care. Most recently, and this isn't something we subscribe to, uh, US News and World's World Report named us one of the top 100 hospitals in the country for joint replacement. Um, and that is a, a mark of pride for us. Uh, Dr. Boynton, our chief medical director and his orthopedic team and everybody in the OR uh, from the housekeepers to everybody. What this means is you don't have to go to Rochester, Minnesota, to the Mayo Clinic to have some of the best outcomes in the country for your knee or hip replacement surgery. You can get it right here in Vermont, here in Rutland. So uh, we have worked hard um, and under Judy's stewardship of the finances here, uh, to make sure that we are in compliance with um, meet the letter of uh, the Green Mountain Care Board's budget parameters. Um, we are also taking a leading uh, stance in advancing health care in Rutland County. Uh, and we do some things that um, no other community hospital in Vermont is doing, uh, providing mental health and substance abuse services. Uh, we are the only uh, acute care hospital that has level one beds in-house. Uh, when we stepped up after the closure of the state hospital uh, um, due to Hurricane Irene, and we provided those services, and which have had a statewide impact. And then, um, you know, up until about seven years ago, there was no medication-assisted treatment program for people who were suffering from, uh, and families who were suffering from uh, the scourge of opiate addiction. And about seven years ago, as a result of urging from Project Vision here in Rutland, uh, Rutland Regional stepped up to the plate. My predecessor, Tom Hubner, and the staff stepped up to the plate and opened the Westridge Center, uh, which provides methadone and suboxone treatment uh, for people. And uh, we, as of today, we have 350 to 400 people that we've given parts of their lives back. They can hold down jobs, they can function, they can be present for their families and loved ones. It is, an, it is a really important part of our mission and what we do here. So uh, with COVID, um, you're gonna hear probably, um, you know, 13 stories of hospitals like Rutland Regional that have done some heroic things in response to COVID. Um, you know, we've done a whole host of things. Uh, we, early on in this, um, 
response, we developed three principles. First and foremost, to, to protect our patients. Um, and so we started doing a whole host of things here to make sure that they were safe um, and providing alternative ways for them to access care through telehealth and so forth. At the peak of COVID, of the surge back in April, we had five uh, active COVID patients in-house and we had about 10 PUIs, persons under investigation. Uh, that was at the peak uh, of our surge. And of those uh, five people that were in-house, four were ventilated in the ICU, uh, three of whom we've sent home, um, like this gentleman in the, in the slide above here who we celebrated after being here for about 60 days. Um, and we were able to send him out of here and, and back home. Um, tremendous response. The second part of our response was protect our staff. Everything we could do, all the resources of this organization, and the reason we have uh, had some balance sheet and so forth, um, we did everything possible to protect our staff during this crisis. Um, so we were able to um, do a whole host of things to ensure they had access to personal protective equipment, we had a number of people from our communities that helped us out in that, who uh, contractors and businesses who came out of the woodwork and provided us with N95 respirator masks. Um, we did a whole host of things to try to cons conserve N95s because we didn't know at, at whatever price we could, we could pay, we didn't know, it wasn't a matter of cost, we just couldn't access those back in March and April. And we were tremendously afraid that our staff were gonna be doing high risk procedures like intubations, um, wearing bandanas around their face. And because of the work, uh, the incredible leadership of folks like Betsy Hassan, our chief nursing director, Todd Gregory, the medical director for emergency medicine, Rick Hildebrandt, our emergency, uh, our medical director for hospital medicine, Dr. Mel Boynton, our chief medical director, um, and all the clinical leadership, uh, we were able to make sure that our staff were protected. They had enough N95s, enough personal protective equipment, and so forth. And then the final uh, piece of, of our, our mantra during this was, ensure the operational capability of Rutland Regional Medical Center. Make sure that we were gonna be there and be able to take care of patients no matter how many showed up at the door, no matter what happened at Castleton University, no matter what happened uh, with the nursing homes and the schools. And we did a whole, whole host of things to make sure that our facility was able to do that. Um, stripping out key services like endoscopy, shutting down that unit and converting it almost overnight to a 10 bed negative pressure COVID positive ward to make sure we had that. Here's a picture of us, um, Rutland Regional stepped up to the plate and a whole host of our staff worked to take over the Spartan Arena hockey rink and convert it into a hundred plus bed alternative care site should we get um, for lower level patients, should we have a surge that we couldn't manage. Um, tremendous amount of work and we did a lot of uh, things to try to connect. These are some examples of some full page ads we've run to try to get the word out, work with the Vermont Department of Health uh, to get the word out to our community on what they need to do to protect themselves and help the hospital make sure we could manage this. And so we continue um, this is a, an example of a get behind the mask campaign to try to continue these efforts for community health. Um, so we are um, going through and living through an unprecedented time in history. And I will tell you from my vantage point on the ground um, that Vermont and our health system has performed exceptionally starting with Governor Scott, Commissioner Levine, as Jeff Tiemann said, um, uh, Secretary Smith, uh, Vermont, uh, the state agencies were tremendously supportive. Uh, they did all the right things. And I will tell you, I also include uh, you, our regulator, in that. We appreciate you understanding 
the stresses that our staff were under during the crisis period of COVID. Um, and I want to thank you for having some, um, giving us some leeway uh, because our finance folks, Judy and her team, they were boots on the ground just trying to make sure that we had liquidity and do all the financial maneuvering that we needed to do, unprecedented maneuvering to make sure we had liquidity, um, to make sure that we um, brought some of our costs down because we did not know if or when relief was going to come. And we felt we had to take matters into our own hands um, and to make sure that when relief came, that we accessed our fair share of that for our hospital and our um, community in order to protect our patients, protect our staff, and to ensure the operational capability of this hospital. Um, so we, you are going to hear, uh, Judy's going to take over in a couple minutes and talk about um, some of the details on our budget, but we followed several principles um, to guide our budget. Uh, our goals uh, were to safeguard the long-term financial viability of Rutland Regional through this contingency phase of COVID, um, to continue to provide access to our full range of healthcare services that are necessary to meet the needs of our community, uh, and to provide a safe environment for our staff to work and patients to receive care. Those are the principles that have guided our budget this year. Um, and you will see Judy talk to you about in detail about some of the things we did to manage liquidity and cash flows, what we did to react in our capital planning um, and pension management uh, 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 strategies and funding to make sure that we had liquidity and to respond to this uh, unprecedented financial impact of COVID. Um, you will see that we are continuing all the programs that we have provided. We are not cutting back, nor do we have plans on uh, closing programs or cutting back, although we've had to cut back on some staff, and we'll talk to you about that. Um, we also tried to work to, to live within the parameters, and this has been very challenging, um, to limit our rate increase growth, which has been very challenging this year because we, we, we have seen and we predict an ongoing unprecedented financial change in our finances due to COVID. And then we've uh, continued to try to use uh, this opportunity to do whatever we can and to take additional measures to control costs. However, there is, as you know, um, and as you are finance people on the board too, and, and folks with business and finance economics and health policy planning, you can't cut your way out of this. There is no amount of overhead you can reduce. At some point, you have to go to look at programs, and we hope we don't get to that point. And the budget you're, uh, we presented to you, uh, if, if, if the assumptions hold true, we won't get to that point over the coming year. Um, so this is the 11th or 12th hospital budget I presented in Vermont between Bishka and the Green Mountain Care Board. And never before have uh, we operated with the uncertainty that surrounds this year's budget submission. Um, and Rutland Regional, and I think you're going to hear from the other Vermont hospitals, you know, we went into this crisis following several years of financial challenges uh, and financial constraints. Um, and as you'll see from our presentation, our recovery, our ongoing recovery from COVID is the basis for our financial plan this year. And we are certainly not out of the woods. Uh, our message to our staff and our community, although we have great fatigue from this, is we need to stay the course. We uh, are still have an unprecedented uncertainty. We are still in the contingency phase of operations. We are not back to business as usual or conventional operations. Um, so we've struggled to manage several competing goals as we presented our budget. Maintain One is to maintain our health services to support our community through this COVID crisis, including expanding testing and all that goes along with that. Two is how do we continue to advance healthcare reform and move and make the transition towards value-based care, which ultimately will be the thing that makes the change in how we finance and deliver and controlling costs and increasing quality in healthcare 
I firmly believe. And then the final thing is, how do we manage the overwhelming financial tightrope of keeping rates low while maintaining essential services for our community? Um, Rutland, Vermont is not an affluent state. And uh, Rutland, uh, certainly Rutland County that we serve uh, is one of the more socioeconomically challenged counties of the state. And the challenge with that is, um, if we don't provide some of these services here in Rutland, um, you know, most of the people on this call, we can get over to Dartmouth or to UVM or to Albany, New York, or to Boston to get these services. A lot of the people we take care of, they don't have that option. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Judy Fox. And we are on, I'm sorry, folks, I my one instruction from Susan, I got carried away and couldn't even handle that. So um, I'm going from slide nine, principles to gu guide the budget. And now we are on slide 10, the balance sheet, and I'll turn it over to Judy Fox. So good morning. I'm just transitioning on from, um, I'm getting a little feedback. Is anyone else? Yeah, are you using your phone and your computer, Judy? I am not. I think it's better now. I think we're good. OK. <clears throat> so uh, transitioning from uh, Claudio's overview to the detail of the budget, uh, we're going to take you through a, a very uh, kind of financially based budget um, that that honestly we got back to basics and looking at ways in which we just preserve um, our strength uh, financially so that um, as Claudio alluded to, we're here to offer all of those services that our community requires as well as supporting our staff uh, and our patients. And central to that was our balance sheet. Um, we knew this is not a year where we can build additional capacity and strength in our balance sheet. Our focus was merely to maintain our balance sheet uh, uh, pre-COVID, if you will. Um, and in doing that, uh, we looked at both our working capital um, and what's required there as well as long-term strategic plans. Um, and you'll see that our balance sheet uh, is an effort to maintain um, basically our 2019 uh, balance sheet strength. And uh, next slide, Claudio. Um, looking at some of the metrics uh, that are driven off from that balance sheet, uh, days of cash on hand. So it's been very volatile. Um, as Claudio alluded to, we were uh, very quick to look at uh, liquidity options, uh, both in lines of credit, Medicare advances. Um, and we did see a spike in our, uh, have a spike in our days of cash as of uh, you know July and, and through September. That is eroded um, as we pay back $25 million to the Medicare advance. And that's where you see we'll come back down to kind of pre-COVID measures uh, sitting above about 215 on our days of cash. Uh, our average age of plan, this is uh, contemplated. Uh, you see that we have, in this case, an older plant is a weakening uh, uh, metric. Uh, that was contemplated. That was something that we felt we needed to do um, in order to maintain our, uh, our balance sheet and maintain that strength. It's also in how we chose to invest in our assets. Uh, we're building a medical office building, long-term 40-year uh, asset. Uh, that does play into that average age of plant. So although we do see weakening there, um, that was something that uh, we, we understood going into it. Our most restricted uh, metric on our balance sheet is our debt service coverage ratio. Uh, you can see that uh, this is a ratio that we've not been able to get back to pre-COVID, 18-19 you know, um, levels. And this is a result of restricting our operating margin. Uh, we are coming into this budget with an operating margin below 1%. 1 uh, the operating margin is what drives the debt service coverage ratio. So although we have uh, additional capacity to take on debt, uh, that is not something we would entertain at this at this time just because of that debt, debt service coverage ratio or days of cash. Uh, our cash balances are critical. Uh, you're going to hear a, a, a latest kind of um, information on Rutland uh, taking a deeper stance in one care and looking at 
uh, our Medicare program, which we don't have reserves built for. Balance sheet strength requires that. Um, and then, of course, our age of plant, uh, where we've really put in forth uh, changes in our uh, strategic position in how we invest in capital. Next slide. Um, and with this, our, our focus for many of our strategic decisions in 2021 result primarily from our available cash flows. We uh, look at where we are, we look at our contribution to margin, both from our investments and our operating margin, and then decided where our deficits were and what we could afford to fund off income statement. Those things primarily are pension funding, the way we invest back into um, our, our capital structure, both with equipment and buildings. Um, and in both cases, we've restricted both contributions to pension and our um, investment in capital. Investment in capital, we've taken $5 million off the table in funding. Um, and with our pension, we've eliminated a $2 million pension contribution that we have committed to as an organization over the past number of years. There are different risks associated with both of those. Um, there is still some risk in our available cash flow. This is predicated on a, a market that does return a margin in about 4%, which drives about an $8 million in, uh, investment increase. Um, it is predicated on us managing, which you're gonna hear a $12.7 million decline or decrease in our cost structure. Um, no additional inflationary pressures um, and that we do not have um, extensive capital investment requirements beyond what we know today for infrastructure and, and equipment um, as demanded by our response to COVID. The other piece that we're very focused on from a cash flow standpoint is in 2023, we will have to remarket debt and, and we'll have about $15 million that we need to remarket. We need to go into that remarketing at a point where we've demonstrated trends uh, that are uh, sustainable and profitable and something that we would have investors and uh, banking institutions uh, willing to uh, take our credit. Next slide. We're on, uh, we're on slide 13 now. 13. So a snapshot of our income statement, uh, we'll, we'll go into detail here, but what you see here um, is a fairly large reduction in our revenue base, a decline of almost 40 million, $38.5 million, offset by a request for a 6% rate increase. We'll talk about that rate increase. Uh, we are not anticipating any additional CARES funding in 2021. Uh, we've received about $20 million thus far um, in 2020, and we do have an ask out to both FEMA and the Vermont CARES Act, uh, where we're hoping for at least a, a, a two and a half million to secure operations in 2020. Um, when we first put this budget together, uh, we were anticipating that we would participate in one care uh, for risk programs related to Medicaid, Blue Cross, and our MVP. We're going to tell you that we are looking at our participation again to also include a particip participation in the Medicare program, uh, which would add approximately 9,000 more lives and $100 million more in, in care. Um, <clears throat> we'll look at that in, in a moment. And then our cost structure, and this is uh, has inherent risk in it, uh, reduced our cost structure by 4.5%, $12.7 million, uh, predicated both on fixed cost and uh, variable costs related to that decline in revenue, um, and led uh, by a reduction of 40 FTEs. Slide 14. But to get there and to understand where uh, we landed for 2021, we really needed to come to terms with our 2020 performance. And where did we think we would end as of September 30th of this year? Uh, given the uh, just difficult uh, past four months and the volatility in revenue, uh, looking back at uh, where we were in you know, the heightened COVID days we were losing and $500,000 a day, that's expenses over uh, income, um, and wondering and, and trying to determine where our patients were in confidence and coming back to receive care. 
Uh, so we have uh, early on projected kind of a restart, if you will, of volume. You can see our projections there where we really began when we opened back up services uh, in May. Uh, we projected a 20% increase and then layered on additional increases in June and July and holding as of July at about 80%. Uh, those have rang primarily true, uh, our projections, such that if you look as of July of, of this year, uh, we are behind our budget by about uh, $28 million in net revenue. Uh, so we've got uh, uh, August and September left to go. There's our CARES funding. Um, and so the net impact uh, of this is a deficit from budget. This is not an operating margin deficit, but a difference of where we thought we would be in our budget of uh, operating margin of 2.5% or $6.7 million. Uh, we think we're going to come in somewhere around $1.3 million. Next slide. And it's important to understand why hospitals need an operating margin. Um, this isn't something uh, that is just kind of uh, picked out of the sky, if you will. It's very contemplated. Um, and it is a result of cash requirements outside of uh, the profit and loss statement. And for Rutland, uh, it has been very consistent in our approach to operating margins. Um, and those operating margins were meant to fund pension, any capital investment over and above our depreciation, any third party settlements to payers, um, and then to pay down the principal portion of debt. When we look at that and look at our strategies, that calls for a 2.5% margin, or roughly $7 million in operating margin. Uh, when we looked at how to attain that this year in 2021, given the drastic decline in volume, we knew that that was not going to be attainable. And so we needed to make those decisions and those hard decisions around uh, where we could uh, minimize cash impact and not affect patient care services. Um, and for us, uh, that decision, as we've talked about, uh, we are we're not funding our pension plan. Uh, that's a cash savings of $2 million. We've held our capital investment to our depreciation. Our strategic position has always been that we would invest in capital at about 1.2 times our depreciation. This year, that was not attainable. We don't believe we have any large third party settlements. Um, we do have to pay principal on debt. So where we landed was with a modest 0.7% operating margin, uh, which yields $1.7 million in cash. Um, and that is primarily to pay the principal on our debt. What this allows us to do is support operations with operations. This is very dif different than where we have been over the past five years. Over the past five years, if you look at our operating margin budget compared to performance, uh, we're down by almost $12 million or 39%. Uh, this required that we transfer from investments to operations $13 million. That was 8% of our corpus at that time of our investment. So we know that's not sustainable. Uh, we think this is real realistic and we think we can manage to this. Um, but again, this is uh, the reason why uh, we needed an operating margin and we can't go lower than this. Next slide, 16. Let, let, me, just, uh, let me just add in here um, and provide a little color commentary. This is our operating margin, what we budgeted in the blue and what we actually achieved for the past several years here. Um, as uh, uh, some of you recall in 2016 we had somewhat of a windfall banner year um, where we had about a five six percent operating margin and midway through that year we gave some of that back by actually having a mid-year rate reduction of about five a little over five percent uh, and as you can see in 17 18 19 given the parameters um, that we had to work with, we've never fully recovered from that. There is a negative 
compounding effect on a rate reduction. And as you can see, um, going through this, this was the challenges we entered into COVID. Um, and, uh, you know, 2021 is a conservative budget, but we will need to get back and get back to this standard level of two and a half percent operating margins, or we risk um, weakening ourselves financially. Okay. So in summary, very high level, um, our net patient service revenue. Uh, when we look at our position in 2020, uh, we had a $267 million net patient service revenue. When we look at the impact of 2021, given COVID, our rate increases, uh, we see from a net perspective about a $28.7 million reduction in net revenue offset by about eight and a half million dollars driven by a 6% rate increase. What that does is achieve $247 million in net patient revenue, $20 million less than we had last year. Um, when we layer on our operating revenue, other operating revenue, which is primarily 340B in pharmaceutical revenue, what we have to support our cost structure here in Rutland is $268 million a year. Um, if we were to uh, comply or uh, run up against uh, the Green Mountain Care Board regulation that does uh, allow us to grow our rates, our net revenue by three and a half percent, we would have had to raise rates considering the volume decline by 27%. We knew that just was not uh, realistic, not attainable, not anything that we could ask our community to bear. Slide 17. Part of the issue with a rate increase is that um, it is becoming more and more ineffective. Um, and by that, I mean that fewer and fewer uh, uh, bases of revenue are contributing uh, to the rate increase. Um, this is the cost shift. We've all talked about it. Um, if you look at our revenue and you look at Medicare in, in, in particular, you see that from a gross revenue perspective, Medicare uh, accounts for 51% of our business. From a net revenue perspective, it's only 37%. Medicare and Medicaid both continue to see declining reimbursement ratios. You see Medicare uh, from projection to budget, 33 to 31%. Medicaid, we lose a percent as well. This budget does not contemplate any significant changes or what I would call a deterioration in our payer mix. We are assuming stability, which in and of itself is a risk. Next slide. In terms of the rate increase, uh, so it's 6%. It is not across the board. Um, it is consistent across all payers, though, um, and it's not across the board because of uh, policies and, and rate setting strategies that we have in place. All of our pharmaceutical and supply charges are based on our acquisition cost, and so those rates based on our tiering structure fluctuate with our cost uh, to procure those. We've not uh, increased any professional services, uh, physician fees uh, uh, at all in our, in our increase which means that all other charges uh, on average are going to uh, increase about eight and a half percent. When you look at that impact from an inpatient to an outpatient perspective, you can see that the rate increase is a bit heavier on the outpatient side at about 3.7 percent, a bit lighter on the inpatient side. It's driving about $8.3 million of net revenue. Next slide. Slide 19. When we look at um, our past requests to the Green Mountain Care Board and we look at where we are compared to other Vermont hospitals, uh, we are on uh, the lower end of the rate increase. Um, and this is driven by that 2017 decline in our rates of 5%. Um, and so essentially, if we look at 17 and 18, um, those net to about zero. So we went for a couple of years without any effective rate increase. Uh, going into this year, our average approved rate increase was 2.9%, again, at the lower end of, of the scale. 
slide 20. In terms of uh, just the, the base of the budget um, volume, and this is was important for us to understand, um, it is difficult to pin down. Uh, we are still understanding volume patterns with, with COVID. Uh, we have not anticipated a second surge of COVID. So uh, what we are um, projecting is that we are going to see a slight decline um, in inpatient services, uh, many driven from our surgical services, which ripples throughout the organ organization with testing and imaging and lab and pharmacy and bed rates. Um, so on average, we think that we're going to see a decline of about two patients a day on the inpatient side driven from surgical volume. That's roughly 500 patients a year. Um, and then we'll see a slight decline in our uh, med onc unit of about two patients a day. When we look at our budgeted average daily census for 2021, uh, we're pinning it at 82, 83 patients a day. We've got work to do to get there. As of July, our average daily census was 77. So between now and uh, the first of the year, we've got to increase our inpatient services by an, about 8% in order to achieve this budget. Um, most of that uh, will be driven through uh, practices in uh, surgical volume, uh, again, which drive volume throughout the house. Next slide. <clears throat> slide 21, uh, gross revenue. Um, this is uh, not something that we should look uh, too heavily on because it's really about net revenue, but the underlying uh, gross revenue, this is, we offer you some insight both pre-COVID and after COVID. Pre-COVID, um, it was basically going to be uh, a, a budget that looked very similar to 2020. Um, we were going to write some revenue uh, around, but honestly, it was going to be almost uh, net neutral. Uh, we have considered that impact of COVID. Um, it was too extensive to list out by department. On average, uh, through all of our services, gross revenue we think is going to go about $39 million under budget. This is all driven by inpatient services, inpatient professional fees, inpatient ancillary fees, inpatient bed rates. We've uh, held our outpatient services to 2020 levels, and honestly, we're performing at 2020 levels. The rate increase, and, and this is an important metric, uh, drives $32 million of gross revenue. It drives $8.4 million of net revenue, and that is where I say rate increases um, are, are really becoming more and more ineffective and that they are not generating much net revenue. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, and here's the impact of that cost shift and those payers not participating in, in uh, rate increases. When you look at our collection ratio, and we tend to look at the net to gross, um, our net to gross fell in 2021 to 42.8% from 45.8. That alone drives a difference in net revenue of 17.3 million. It's what discounts us from that $32 million in gross charges to $8 million in net. Um, and here's, here's how that it, uh, comes to be. Uh, we have $23 million of the rate increase that payers just don't participate in. This is our Medicare and Medicaid vo volume. It's about 70% of our volume. Uh, we are uh, uh, subsidizing a bit of that rate increase with a Medicare market basket of about 1.6, but definitely not at that 6% level. Uh, we continue to see changes in Blue Cross payments, um, and then our own employees who are seeking care. Um, we see what we have a domestic discount. That's about a $2.2 million uh, of additional uh, reimbursement that we won't see as a result of, of those uh, utilization patterns. We lost some state reimbursement for our psychiatric uh, unit, our six bed acute psychiatric unit. Um, most of that relates to care uh, that's provided to those patients in our ED. That was about a million dollar loss. 
Uh, we have trued up our commercial base to existing contracts, which was about $600,000. We have a slight change in our unreserved. And then all other, which is really service mix. And honestly, it's the change in that transition of weighting our uh, our revenue more toward a medical service than a surgical service due to that decline. Uh, that drives about another 1.3 million. Offsetting that is that rate increase of 8.3. And then uh, additional uh, fixed payments through Medicaid, uh, OneCare, uh, related to the, the next uh, gen, the Medicaid uh, program and the expansion of those attributed lives will drive about $3 million, netting the change to 17.3. Very important to understand that. Next slide. And then we have our bad debt and free care. Uh, this is something that we don't take lightly. Uh, this is a service that um, we try to be advocates to our patients. Um, we are seeing about a 2.6% um, uh, need to reserve um, with about 1.6 on our bad debt and a, a percentage on free care. We have one of the most um, generous, if not the generous free care programs in the state. Um, and because of COVID uh, within the last six weeks, we have halted uh, account collection calls and sending any accounts to collection. Um, that does stress and challenge our ability to meet our reserve levels. Um, and we're also seeing, and we've talked about this, and this will be the third year, um, that we are seeing patients who are getting into commercial plans that have high copay and deductibles, and they just have no financial means to be able to meet those deductibles. If you look at the graph on the top, you can see the, the red, green, and purple. Those are those high deductible, high copay plans uh, that are accessing free care because uh, the patients just don't have a means to, to be able to uh, support those. Next slide. So ACL risk, this is uh, the piece of the budget that has changed since we submitted our information to you. Uh, when we submitted, uh, we uh, have made the decision uh, with our community partners here, the FQHC in town, uh, as well as some private uh, physicians that we would join, uh, continue participation in the Medicaid program, the Blue Cross primary, the self-insured program, and the MVP qualified health plan. Uh, at that point, we had uh, made the decision that we could not entertain a position with a Medicare program because the risk was too high. And uh, the, the risk with the corridors in place at the time would have been between eight and $10 million. Uh, where we felt comfortable is with this um, lineup of risk programs. Uh, which would present about $840,000 of, of risk um, and would have Rutland uh, taking care of uh, about 20,000 lives within our risk program. <clears throat> Next slide. So we're on slide let, 25. Let, 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 yeah, let me yeah, just, let me uh, just uh, uh, comment in on this too. Um, I think one of the things that we have seen uh, is in response to the COVID crisis is the One Care ACO has done a lot of very impressive and important things to try to make it feasible for us to stay in the program and potentially even expand uh, our uh, participation in the program to the Medicare program. And I uh, understand that the Green Mountain Care Board also had some influence in negotiating with federal Medicare program about our risk corridors. Um, but the founders, uh, both UVM and Dartmouth, and the uh, uh, Vicki Lohner and the leadership of the uh, One Care Accountable Care Organization uh, have done some really challenging things to bring down their over overhead in order to bring down our dues and to bring down our, our risk exposure so that, A, we can stay in this important um, uh, program for Vermont and for Vermonters and for our healthcare system, and B, uh, make it attractive to us that we might uh, we might be able to, it might be feasible for us 
to look at extending into the Medicare program and thus help the state um, achieve some of the scale targets that were established several years ago when this program, this novel program was established. So very good work. And I don't think they're recognized enough from the accountable care organization um, and the commitment of UVM and Dartmouth as the two founders of this on the work they've done to try to make this feasible and make this a successful program for Vermonters. Thanks. So uh, as Claudio just stated, um, we've seen some uh, remarkable uh, response from One Care, um, such that uh, looking at our first year participation, um, had we not participated in One Care, our operating margin would have been $2.1 million more than what we presented. Um, and there are, there are primarily three reasons for that. The first is risk. Um, we will be submitting a check to One Care for about uh, $900,000 uh, to cover our portion of the risk. Uh, we really bumped up against the risk corridors. Without those corridors in place, our risk would have been over $2 million. We see those ACO dues, which fund the infrastructure uh, of the ACO, as well as all of those population health payments. That was about another million dollars. And then the other piece we track is the care we provided to our patients within our services here at the hospital versus those fixed payments. Um, had we not been in, we would have received about $280,000 more in, fixed, uh, in uh, fee for service than we did in fixed payments. You can see in uh, 2020 uh, we, that is coming down. Um, <clears throat> the biggest piece here is that it's still an unknown. Um, we saw that just stoppage of services. How is that going to impact our Medicaid basis? Uh, are, are there going to be ramped up and um, accelerated services at the end of the year? Um, but really where we were focused on is 2021. Um, and this is the hard work that Claudio alluded to of the ACO. We are uh, really working with the payers and narrowing the risk corridors. That was significant for us to be able to continue to take on risk. Um, engaging primary care and risk management uh, helps us better uh, align ourselves for community services and care management services here. We see the continued year over year reduction in the ACO's expense. Um, and the other piece is just transitioning care management from performance to a performance based structure as opposed to a capacity base. We see those as all positive uh, indicators of, of uh, program changes at the ACO. Um, it is what will allow us to really contemplate joining Medicare. And again, that Medicare decision before us covers about 9,000 lives. Um, it's about $100 million, carries a risk of about another million. Um, but what it will do is provide about a half a million dollars of additional care management support to our community so that we can continue to build and enhance those programs. Slide 26, other operating revenue. A uh, piece I really want to leave you here with is, um, so this is $20 million. It helps support our cost structure, really important. 75% of it comes from ph pharmaceutical programs, either our retail pharmacy or our 340B pharmacy uh, program. Next slide. Without 340B, we would stand to lose substantial money. Um, and in uh, fiscal 19, we would have lost $10 million. We would have lost money in 18 as well as 17. We're not unlike any other Vermont hospital. Without 340B, all hospitals are at risk for significant uh, instability and significant losses. This is a program that is under uh, enormous amount of scrutiny, uh, payers, all want changes. Uh, the federal government is looking at changes. CMS is looking at changes, all related to uh, really minimizing this, <clears throat> um, this program for community hospitals. It is important to us. It funds our free care. So, you know, we provided free care to over 6,700 employee or patients 
Um, it helps us with the uh, uh, managing our un uncollectible uh, debt. It helps us provide access to care in those services that we know we lose money, behavioral health, substance abuse, uh, women's health services, long-term care issues for patients who um, don't have a plan of discharge and end up uh, being almost residents in our, in our hospital. And so I can't say enough how important 340B is to the stability of the Vermont um, uh, healthcare and, and hospital network. Next slide. In terms of investments, um, <clears throat> so, you know, we have um, had some great years in investments. We've been able to really amass some, some savings, um, and then we hit the volatile market this spring. Uh, we are not um, being <clears throat> um, exceptionally um, Dacronian, if you will, in our investment returns. We are assuming a five-year average, which says that we're going to generate about 4.2%, which is equivalent of about $8 million of, operate, of uh, investment margin. This is in line with our uh, benchmarks. What's important here to understand is that we have to cover our operational expenses to be able to maintain the stability in our investments. Um, if you look at any growth in our investments, it has been uh, truly just related to market. Um, in fact, over the last four years, we've had to draw $13 million, about 8% at the time, um, of our investment corpus to cover operational losses. And you see that uh, in 2018, where we, we uh, really had to move money in order to cover those operational needs because of the lack of an operating margin. Next slide. Here's where the tough work really came in. Um, and honestly, there's an enormous amount of risk inherent in what I'm about to share with you. So when we looked at that net patient revenue and we saw the $20 million decline year over year, uh, that had a direct impact on our cost structure. And so we were looking at ways in which we could curb our spending and or limit our operating margin. Uh, we had very engaged senior leadership team here uh, who came together and really made some tough decisions. Uh, we have cut our cost structure by $12.7 million, 4.5% budget to budget, um, and no cost or program was off the table. Um, physician cost went down 4%. We reduced staff. 40 FTEs, uh, driving about a $2 million change. We've also put in some very tight protocols on premium pay and overtime. Uh, we have uh, cut our temporary staffing and we have canceled close to 25 contracts over the past uh, few months, looking at only staffing uh, with temporary staff in those hard to fill areas, uh, primarily our uh, OR. Pharmaceuticals, uh, Jonathan Reynolds, a, a, a VP here over that cost center, worked hard to find savings there. We've actually moved our host, wholesaler from uh, uh, Cardinal to McKesson, so we're seeing some nice positive uh, reductions there. This is also linked to the decline in revenue as well. So there's a fixed piece and there's a variable piece. Our pension programs, so even though we have let up on uh, contributing to our pension program, we have a very engaged uh, 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 fiduciary uh, team looking over our pension program, led by actuaries, our investment advisory committee, um, and our investment advisors. We were not uh, at risk at all during COVID for a decline in our uh, funded status of our pension plan. Our pension plan is considered model. Um, and here is the result of a model pension plan. It actually gives back. Uh, so those returns uh, in our uh, pension uh, funding status has helped us maintain our cost structure here. Disproportionate share, this is a calculation at 6% of net revenue. Um, depreciation, this is really limiting our capital spending. Again, we took $5 million of funding off the table, uh, really trying to match uh, spending to depreciation. And then everything else uh, basically uh, comes to about zero. We couldn't get 
any further. And so that's where we made the tough decision around our margin. Um, and we reduced our margin by $5 million. Um, and again, only covering that debt service uh, with with um, our, our existing debt and then the medical office building. What you don't see in that uh, uh, lineup of cost reductions is the cost avoidance. Um, we also have made the very difficult decision that we would forego any salary adjustment program, cost of living market in 2021. This represents a cost avoidance of $2.7 million. And it also puts inherent risk on our table as we think about uh, the labor market and our competitive recruitment environment and not running to temporary staffing to fill vacancies. Uh, so this is something that we continue to manage on a daily basis and really look at our recruitment and hiring practices. Next slide. Uh, I just want to add in here, I want to give a shout out to our union. This would not have been uh, possible without their cooperation and compliance and agreement to uh, put off uh, wage increases for the coming year. Um, and uh, we've had a good partnership with them throughout all the challenges and changes that we've had. Um, uh, and I feel very fortunate that we have the nursing union that we have that has been uh, really good partners in, in uh, these extraordinary times. Slide 30. So the result is what you see, um, we, we call it, you know, bending the cost curve. Um, if you look at our productivity results, our productivity results are getting us back to 2019. I can't tell you how difficult this is. Um, it's a reduction of 40 FTEs. Um, and, and with these productivity results, when you have a shrinking revenue basis, a shrinking volume basis, you have less base to allocate your fixed costs. And so uh, this productivity result uh, is remarkable for this organization um, and only the result of you know, lots of disciplined hard work. Um, some of these FTEs relate to volume. Uh, a good portion of them relate to just changes um, in, in uh, workflows and uh, looking at value added uh, as opposed to um, uh, where we have been in the past and really eliminating some, some work requirement. This next slide lends itself to the same result uh, when we look at our cost structure. So slide 31, Claudio. <laughs> Thank oh, you. You can't see it? Is it up? Yep, can now. Okay. Um, so this is based on patient days. Again, you see that same performance where we're getting back to levels in this case uh, prior to 2019. Again, $12.7 million cost reduction driving this and outpacing uh, what would have happened with just uh, a reduction uh, of uh, variable costs related to volume. Next slide. Uh, you asked for service line adjustments. Uh, this is probably a slide that we are very uh, proud of um, in that with all that has gone on, we have maintained every service that we have provided to our community. Uh, we have not cut back on any, any service regardless of its contribution to margin. Uh, we have uh, full support in our behavioral health, substance abuse, women's health, those long-term care patients. We've not shifted any service to any other provider. Um, and we continue uh, based on our guidance that our community health needs assessment provided us uh, to invest back into our community, uh, looking uh, most critically at our housing and transportation needs. And, and, and I just want to add, it's not, these are some of the, you know, more um, uh, common ones that people identify, but it's not just these services that lose money for the hospital. If we were to put them in columns, we'd have a very short column of things that make money. And we'd have a very long column of things, of, of things obviously, that are cross-subsidized by those literally handful of services that actually make money. Uh, outpatient surgery, not necessarily the inpatient care, 
Um, you know, diagnostic procedures, uh, obviously our 340B and pharmaceutical programs, you know, there's a small list of those things. So, you know, we could spend uh, a whole um, hour talking about uh, that and the cross subsidy and the challenges with maintaining those services. In terms of capital, I, we have a lineup of capital projects that total about 12.5 million, again, equivalent to depreciation. Uh, the, the largest item on the list is a CON uh, for the replacement of our um, MRI. Uh, that will be before you within the next few weeks. Uh, this MRI is old. It's over 15 years old, it's fully depreciated, uh, is a workhorse uh, in, in our organization. <clears throat> Aside from that, you know, just tough decisions on balancing uh, medical equipment uh, with the need to keep our infrastructure up to date uh, and, and efficient. Um, what you don't see here is funding for additional COVID considerations. And this is why we've restricted our routine capital. Um, we know that we have to consider air handling, testing, patient distancing, disinfecting, um, and we are in a process of looking at each of those. In fact, uh, air handling, uh, we are looking to make every ICU room a negative pressure room. Uh, that's gonna cost about a million dollars. You don't see that in our capital plan anywhere. Um, we are also trying to move our curbside testing to a permanent location before winter strikes. Uh, those individuals, both in the clinical side and the rest, uh, registration side, out there in all of the elements, whether it's raining or 102 degrees and full PPE, a uh, very difficult situation for them. So that is a priority project. Those projects, we are going to look for state CARES funding, FEMA funding first, and then we will look to our investments um, and we will use those investments very prudently to fund those projects. Let me just add on testing. This has been a real focus of our organization. We were the second hospital in the state to be able to ramp up and do in-house PCR uh, molecular COVID testing in-house. We had an instrument in place, a high volume instrument, and um, we geared that up in order to be able to um, in order to be able to do that. The challenge has been um, is we have not been able to, we've had interruptions in the supply chain of reagents and materials to conduct this testing in-house. And the importance of doing this, both for the hospital operations, and for our service area, the businesses, the jails, the nursing homes. Now, I know the state is coming in and they're managing some of this, but uh, for us to be able to do local uh, COVID PCR testing and to be able to get results back to clinicians within the same day is really helpful for our businesses to be able to stay open and us to manage over the next coming year of the uncertainty that COVID is going to have, especially in the fall, especially over over the winter time and how this how we do. We have a, uh, we have issued purchase orders for two other um, high volume PCR platforms. Our strategy is to diversify our base of testing for this. We have a local community benefactor that has graciously and very generously helped us. He, he, uh, they have seen the importance of this for our community. And so we are trying to, however, the challenges as the rest of the, hot, of the country has heated up, our delivery dates for this equipment have been pushed back. But we do have a second platform that we hope to have online by the end of September that will be very helpful for us. And hopefully with a number of areas, if we can um, can, you know, the original the original platform that we currently have, you know, we have enough volume to run 100 to 150 COVID tests per day. However, 
the supply chain uh, interruptions have restricted our ability to to run only about 20 to 30 tests per day. So we're, you know, we're trying to prioritize that testing for clinical needs for people that we need immediate results for are getting in-house testing and the rest we're sending out through the UVM state of Vermont um, and outside reference lab, Mayo, et cetera, network. So real important piece of our ability over the next uh, the, the fall and winter to manage this is our ability to be able to provide access to testing. Claudio, we, we've heard that from other hospitals as well. By diversifying the machinery that you have, is it easier to get certain uh, rapid sepient uh, media kits than others, or um, what's the theory there? Well, we think we think that's the key, diversifying our supply chain. So if uh, vendor A, um, you know, we have supply interruptions, hopefully vendor B, we still have, we can get it from vendor B and vice versa. If vendor B, you know, just having more diversified portfolio and more avenues of getting that so that we can continually have have those test kits that we need to run those tests. In, in uh, preparation for receipt of those machines, have you already ordered the media and has it come in? Uh, they won't uh, send us, um, uh, Chairman Mullen, they won't send us the test kits until we have the machine up and running and validated. We have to kind of, the lab folks have to kind of build the test and validate the testing. And once we get that online and validated, they did that. But one of the vendors that we have, uh, that the, this machinery that we hope to get in by the end of an operational by the end of September um, into October, um, they have pledged to us that we should be able to get um, about 300 test kits per week um, from them. So let's hope that holds out. The challenge has been, again, as the rest of the country has, you know, they've, they've diverted that and the supply, you know, it's been a real challenge. The testing issue continues to be one of our major challenges in managing this on the ground. Thank you. So uh, Judy and I are going to try to tag team in this a little bit. We've um, identified in our budget what are the areas of risk? What are the biggest uncertainties and 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 uh, assumptions that could um, that are unpredictable, and we have no way of knowing how they will bear out? Um, so you know, the first one is: um, Will our volumes differ? Will first and foremost, will we get another wave of COVID causing us to have to shut down elective procedures and so forth, or that will um, make uh, patients less confident to come out confident to come out and seek care that they need. Um, you know, even during the COVID crisis phase, from February through mid February through mid May, we saw an unprecedented decline in ER volumes, even in acute care things like strokes and cardiac conditions and so forth, which made us wonder were patients more scared of coming to the hospital and contracting COVID than they were of having the chest pain and waiting it out at home. We're still trying to figure out what the what really precipitated that, but we don't know how that's gonna happen, especially if Vermont gets hit with another wave. Judy, I'll let you take the payer mix one. Sure. Uh, so as uh, I stated earlier, we have not projected a significant change in our payer mix. Um, and that provides some risk for a couple of reasons. Um, we do see uh, unemployment rising, and with that is the loss of commercial insurance. Uh, that is a risk to our organization. If we lose that commercial insurance base, which at this point is about 30% of our volume, uh, and those uh, patients transition to either Medicaid or just uh, have no insurance coverage at all. We see shift in federal and state payer programs. Um, this is somewhat mitigated, mitigated if we can get into the ACO, uh, but absent that there are a whole host of changes uh, in particularly the Medicare program that would serve to take reimbursement off the table for us. And so we will continue to watch those. Um, and then even within the commercial coverage as uh, uh, the community and uh, Vermont residents um, are forced with uh, changes in health care uh, participation rates. Uh, we see uh, and uh, 
there could be a risk of a continued migration to high deductible plans. And again, if you remember of our free care program, about 40% of that is provided to patients who have insurance coverage. They are the underinsured. And so that is a risk. Um, in terms of pressures in commercial contracting, um, we basically have a status quo budget with our commercial payers, MVP, Blue Cross, Cigna. Um, uh, we have not uh, contemplated any deeper discounts uh, with any of those providers nor uh, significant changes in um, their payment programs and payment policies. How, however, we're under ongoing uh, and continuous and inc I would say increasing pressure from the payers to um, reopen the contracts and give them deeper discounts. How many people approached you over the past year, Judy? How many to reopen our contracts? So right now we have eight active contract negotiations in place uh, across a whole host of vendors <clears throat> with and, different asks. And and our message to them, and I understand we, you know, we need strong insurers in Vermont, and also well, I get it, and they've got un, they have their own pressures. But our message to them when they've come to our door is, folks, we gave it the Green Mountain Care Board. And, um, you know, it's not hyperbole. We have, uh, you can see, we've been um, very uh, conservative and restrictive for, um, and we've done a lot of operational things to try to keep our costs down and keep our rate increases to unprecedented levels. If you look over the past five years, I think if you looked over the past uh, 20 years, you would never see a period like the past five years, what hospitals have done in Vermont and, and our work and the impact of the Green Mountain Care Board on um, keeping costs down and rates and growth of health care down to the point of we had several of us had significant rate decreases. Never before has that happened yet. However, they still are coming to our door looking for more discounts and that's when I hide my office and let Judy take the wheel on that. Um, next item we have, this is, this is maybe the most concerning item that we have, um, is uh, the stability of our workforce. Um, you know, will we have to go back to the contract labor market? Um, we have not been able to because our volumes have gone down, but as we get back to and try to get back to pre-COVID levels and hopefully have some stability, are we going to do this? But, you know, I have tremendous sympathy and empathy for everybody who has school-age children. Uh, the challenges and the stresses on those families are incredible. Um, a lot of our staff here have school-age children are feeling those pressures. Um, a lot of our staff here are single Certainly. parents who are trying to manage keeping their job and coming here and, and also taking care of their kids. Uh, and very tremendous, you know, for all the teachers and for all those students are challenging. Um, the other piece about our workforce is we've been we've been at a pretty high level of change and uncertainty fatigue the stress of this and the mental health impact to our employees cannot be uh, overstated um, this is a big concern we've tried to do some things and and taken some of our behavioral health counselors to provide additional support and resources for our staff but this is an ongoing challenge and an ongoing worry um, and then what about our employee health? Um, are we going to see, we've been very fortunate in protecting our staff that we have not had any widespread transmission in-house among our staff, but what's going to happen with a COVID resurgence perhaps and a combination of, a, a you know, hopefully we don't have a bad flu season. Um, that is a big concern. Judy? Sure. So uh, investment in perf performance, we've talked about this. Uh, we are anticipating a return of about 4.2%, uh, $8 million. Um, we have had a history of using investment performance to support operations. You know, that history is a $13 million transfer. It's not that we don't want to use investments. We want to use them wisely and prudently. And things like 
uh, securing our infrastructure, whether it be testing or negative pressure rooms, uh, are what investments are there for. They shouldn't be there to subsidize operating losses year after year. Uh, so we have that risk of just remaining volatility in the market. Um, and then our cost structure. Um, and so when uh, we cut uh, costs as uh, significantly as we did, um, there's a, a worry of uh, scope creep, you know, so we're all looking at uh, that and making sure that we're di very disciplined in our approach. Um, but we also uh, have this shifting and we see um, more emphasis on our fixed costs as your revenue basis comes down. So your fixed costs as a percentage of total uh, become a bit higher, makes it uh, uh, less agile for us. We see increased carrying costs due to inventory par levels, testing supplies and PPE, uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, pharmaceutical spend, uh, we have um, backed off on inflation a bit because of our transition to McKesson and the new hail wholesaler. Um, you think that's okay, um, but you, you know, you just never know. So that's a risk there. Employee health insurance, we're assuming the basis that we have after the reduction of FTEs. What we have not assumed is that we would become, um, uh, uh, we would have to support additional uh, employees and their dependents and spouse should that spouse uh, become unemployed and need to uh, come in under our uh, employee health insurance. Labor market uh, competition, uh, first and foremost, uh, when we forego that salary increase program, want to make sure that we don't get too far behind there uh, and don't want to have to use that expensive temporary staffing labor that uh, we've alluded to. Um, any change in building infrastructure to support COVID care. Uh, we think we've got a handle on testing and, and um, the negative pressure, but is there something else out there? And then additional roles just to promote patient uh, uh, and staff safety, temperature checking at doors, door access, the whole change in patient visitor policies. I can't tell you how difficult that is to manage, how emotional that is to manage, and how much uh, resource we have to put in place to uh, help both our staff and our patients with those, those changing regulations. So what you see here admittedly um, is a list of risks that are more short term focused. Um, and it will be, you know, one of these risks uh, that should we have not gotten our assumption right, that could mandate that we come back before you uh, for an interim budget change. We think that we've got a solid approach, but there's just too much unknown. Uh, we're happy to say that in uh, the fall, September, October, we are going to re-engage in our strategic planning process so that we can look at a full host of strengths and weaknesses, threats and opportunities, risks, uh, and begin to more long-term range a plan. Uh, but honestly, uh, where we are today is very short-term focused and just trying uh, to mitigate the next six to nine months. So does that complete the presentation? It does. Great. So let me start before I pass it off to the first board member for questions, just by thanking you. Um, the board certainly recognizes how difficult it has been to prepare a budget in such uncertain times. And um, we're always appreciative of the, the work. And um, let me just start off by saying um, your presentation was very thorough and uh, we appreciate uh, the candor and um, really the long hours that went into it. So with that, I'm gonna start in alphabetical order with member Holmes, Jessica. Great, okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I actually also wanted to start by thanking um, Claudio, you and your team, Judy, um, you know, for all, all the work that you all did during this public health crisis. I can only, I know we're only hearing about tip of the iceberg of what had to be done to ensure that services were delivered in your community and that PPP, PPE and other, you know, uh, essential materials were available to protect your staff. Um, you know, as we approach the fall, as you mentioned earlier, Claudia, there's so much uncertainty. So I just appreciate the courage and all the hard work that you're still doing. 
as we're still in this pandemic. Um, and an appreciation too, actually, for the, all the cost containment efforts that were, you know, uh, undertaken as well, and preserving service lines, you know, particularly preventative care and all that. So, a huge thank you, genuine thank you. Um, all right. So my first question is really: there is so much uncertainty, and particularly around volume. You know, we have just come out of QHP hearings where insurers are trying to predict what's going to happen to volume in 2021. And all of the hospital budgets have had some predictions about what's going to happen to volume in 2021. And, you know, some are flat, some are over, some are under, you know, insurance companies uh, are predicting pent up demand. I mean, we're, we really are in a very uncertain time. So I'm really trying to understand, in particular, your assumptions. Um, and okay so on page one of the narrative and i think this is also the number that was in the slide if i'm right i think maybe this is a question for judy um the loss uh, in volume was about 28.7 million dollars uh on on net revenue um the chart though in the back of an appendix one of the narrative um it looks to me, and I might be reading this wrong, that the utilization reduction is $26.8 million. So that was a difference I didn't quite understand. Um, and then the percentage over under in that column, or do you see me on Appendix 1? I just want to make sure you're with me. Probably I'm Judy. With you. Okay, perfect. So the reduction there has a 10% reduction in utilization from the 20 budget. But then in the risks and opportunities section of the narrative, um, it talks about the, uh, under volume, it talks about the 2021 budget assumes you'll achieve 95% of the volume. So I'm seeing different absolute numbers and even different percentages of the assumption of what you are predicting for volume and a, and a 90 to 95% difference is like $13 million. It looks like to me. So I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of what, what, First of all, what absolute number we should be thinking about, and then is it, are you assuming 95%? Are you assuming 90%? Maybe we can start there, and then I'll have a follow-up question. So, so I'll let Judy answer this, but I think I'd preface it by by just not all volume obviously is created equal, right? Okay. So, Judy. Yeah. Um, and and so what you are talking about at the the 95% is is an average, and so uh, when we look at those mix of services. Uh, what I will tell you is that from an outpatient perspective, our our assumption was to get back to the 2020 budget. Um, and so we have budgeted uh, fairly consistently with our 2020 budget on outpatient services. Inpatient services are another deal. Um, and that is where our social distance distancing requirements have really come into a play, um, most notably in our OR, uh, where we have really had to uh, kind of curb some of that volume. On the inpatient side, um, uh, we are looking at somewhere between an 88 and a 90 percent, uh, uh, if we if we use the 2020 budget as a base uh, volume. <clears throat> and I will tell you in terms of um, looking at how far can we go, in terms of ramp that ramping back up and an acceleration of services, social distancing limits our ability. We have limited capacity. Um, and that certainly is true within our clinic spaces. Um, and it's definitely true, true within um, our OR theaters and, and space there. Okay, and so one of the areas where you were talking in your presentation were about reduction in surgical volume but also reduction in medical oncology, right? And I, so I'm just curious about that. Surgical volume is that driven reduction driven by lack of patient confidence and sort of postponement of care, or is it social distancing? And but medical oncology is seems um, less easy to postpone. So I'm curious about is that social distancing that's driving that, or or what? So um, the. The surgical volume is being driven by capacity in the OR okay. and getting patients uh, through the OR and into um, our surgical suites for aftercare. Okay. The medical oncology is more geared toward 
patient confidence one uh, in patients returning to us. Um, <clears throat> us, uh, we have a three bed suite uh, that yeah. we don't anticipate using as a three bed suite. So we have a bit of a restriction on capacity. Um, and then the other piece is uh, managing uh, those long term patients. Uh, we actually have a, a, a new contract in place with a nursing home to help us in patient placement with some of those which were nearly residents here. Uh, and so we backed off on what we call that level two or subacute. Um, but primarily it's um, just understanding uh, patients and uh, where they are in seeking services. Okay. Um, and so the 95% is the one I should think about. That's the average overall, that, not the 90% that was in the appendix correct. one. Correct. Okay. So does that mean that we would adjust that 90%? I mean, we would adjust that upward, that utilization upward to reflect a 5% reduction instead of 10 or? But we can hope we, maybe you can get back to us on this because the second column has a 10% reduction in utilization. So I'm still a little bit confused, but I don't want to belabor everybody's points um, of, of that. So maybe in a follow up, perhaps we can chat. Yeah, um, because um, that utilization column, um, uh -huh. it, 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 it's not just uh, volume utilization, it's service mix utilization. It's it's more than just counting widgets, if you will. It, it's okay. to Leo's point, it's the type of service we're providing because that is a net revenue schedule. It is not a gross revenue schedule. Okay. And so in the other okay. And so on the page six, that would have been maybe gross revenue at 95? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, just trying to get my math ordered there. Okay, uh, my second question is around inflation assumptions. I'm really trying to understand what hospitals' uh, assumptions are about healthcare inflation. And, it, and here I'm really talking about price effects alone, so not volume effects, but just literally the price effects. And so assumed in the 2021 budgets. So in terms of the big buckets of expenses, I would think wages, salaries, and benefits would be a big bucket, right? And so you're you're assuming flat there. You're assuming no salary increases. Uh, another bucket is supplies and equipment, just in general. So what is the assumption that you're making about the inflation rate? Again, not volume, not accounting for the fact that there might be a reduction in volume, but just literally the price effect of supplies and equipment. Sure. Um, I'm going to leave equipment to the side uh, because equipment really um, is is more related to our capital budget. Okay. Um, yeah, fair enough. Yep. So pharmaceuticals and our medical supplies, uh, we actually base on acquisition cost. And so we look at the acquisition cost um, in the early spring of the year and we apply our pricing tiers to that. Okay, so pharmaceuticals, you said 6%, right? Was the assumption so, that was being made there? So on pharmaceuticals, what we have done is look at those acquisition costs and add a 6% inflation for the next year. Okay. <clears throat> on the supply costs, we look at those, um, and it depends based on what type of supply cost, but the inflation was well under 2%. Less than two, okay. That's just what I needed to know. And in terms of the makeup of your operating uh, expenses, what would you say wages and benefits is as a percentage of your total expense? Like if I were to do a weighted average of inflation, right? In some sense, what I'm trying to do a back of the envelope calculation on just to try and understand this. I'm assuming that the compensation part of the bucket is a pretty big part of that bucket, right? That's correct. What would that percentage be? So uh, it's probably roughly 60%. Okay, and then pharma? Uh, um, okay. I don't know, eight, ten percent. Okay. I, I'd, I'd have to calculate okay. these numbers. But. Fair enough. I know. I'm really just asking. I'm trying to get a sense of this, and so supplies maybe is about thirty percent, something like that, roughly. It, that's probably a little high, but somewhere in there, yeah. Okay, perfect. I am just trying to get a sense of of inflation as assumed. Um, okay. Um, I guess my. My next question would be, um, is it possible for you to identify COVID-related expenses that you think you're going to carry into 2021 
um, in the presentation and in the materials, there was reference to screeners and PPE and disinfectant and temperature checking and air handling. That's a million, maybe a million dollars. Have you uh, estimated just carved out what the COVID related and had there be without COVID, these would be expenses you would not incur as a part of the 2021 budget? Yes. So I can tell you that our FEMA application, uh, which we will be submitting by September 1st and includes um, COVID related expenses, we will be submitting about $1.4 million of COVID related <clears throat> expense. Okay, perfect. That's very helpful. And so then you had mentioned earlier that um, the combined FEMA and Vermont state funding that you were looking for was about $2 million. Is that right? So that suggests that the application to the state funding is, you know, not very much at all. And I'm wondering if given the revenue losses that have occurred and the costs that you've incurred, why that application for money isn't higher. So FEMA will only reimburse 75%. So that 1.4, uh, we're estimating about a million dollars. Um, and then we look to the state CARES funding uh, for the rest. If we look at um, what we've submitted, so uh, this was actually a question um, that that came um, from the healthcare advocates. Um, unlike most grant programs, we did not request an absolute amount out of the CARES funding, you can't. Uh, so we submitted well over a thousand pages of documentation um, that looked at revenue loss, changes in uh, cost structure, <clears throat> changes in um, salary structure. Um, when we look at what we think and how we think the state should look at that, uh, we think that it would be and somewhere around $2 million that uh, we could get out of state cares with potentially another million um, out of FEMA. Um, but the state has also layered on, um, you know, their own uh, protocols around um, necessity and looking at financial performance. Um, we have received $20 million uh, thus far in CARES funding at the federal level, uh, which helps us set that $38 million in, um, in revenue loss. Um, my, I guess, I mean, I have lots of questions, but I want to be re respectful of others' time, and I'm sure some of the other questions will be answered by, um, asked by others. But let me just, I guess, one final one. And this is about, you know, Claudio, you mentioned the transition to value-based care the possibility of adding Medicare ACO to the program. And I'm just, you know, I'm trying to get a sense of how we've been in, you know, this all payer model for a few years. Payment reform came first and delivery reform is supposed to kind of run in parallel with that payment reform. So I'm actually just wondering, again, and I think I ask this every year, but I'm always curious as to how the answers are evolving over time. What kind of steps is Rutland doing to eliminate low value care, really shift towards high value care. If I asked a random provider at Rutland how his or her practice has changed since, say, for example, joining the ACO or, since, you know, what would that provider say? Like, how is it affecting folks on the ground? If we want this payment reform to work, we have to have the delivery form that goes with it. So I'm wondering what systemic changes are happening at the top level that are trickling down. Well, I think, um, yeah, that's a that's a certainly a fair question. I think obviously payment reform, as challenging as that is, is much harder than delivery form reform. When you take such a complex system that was developed over over decades of how we um, deliver care in a and you know you have to take you know these two are not. These two are not mutually exclusive, right? Uh, delivery follows payment. And we've created our systems of delivery to be able to make sure we can keep the lights on and the doors open and deliver the care. Now, when we start trying to change that, you start changing payment, and now we start trying to move that ocean liner of delivery reform and all the intricate systems that we have put in place, now we try to change that. It is a Her Herculean task. 
And uh, depending upon your market and where you are, um, you know, we've done a lot of work to try to get there. I don't know as if you could say that you could go to a random provider and say, hey, tell me, you know, what's your cost of care for deliver? Uh, what's your average cost of care for your heart failure um, panel and how's your how, how effective are your outcomes? But we are putting in place the infrastructure to be able to try to give those frontline providers those answers. Um, and when Judy's not providing uh, hazard pay programs and thousand page state care act relief things, she is trying to work and build the uh, data infrastructure. And what, so we've created some new positions. We've, um, you know, so we are trying to build that infrastructure so that we can give people that um, that information that they need to know so that they can change that. The other thing that we've been building here really closely is, uh, you know, most of the specialists in Rutland County in our service area are employed by the hospital. None of the primary care providers are employed by the hospital. And obviously, as you know, probably better than I do, folks, is this is really dependent upon how well we integrate with primary care. So we are doing work to integrate our data with primary care, but also to integrate our operations and our care management structure with primary care. And uh, you know, we have reached out and and worked and, and are building more collaborative relationships with our primary care partners than ever before because it is crucial. And so how do we build the care management infrastructure jointly to, to do that? And I think also the ACO, OneCare, is transitioning to, okay, we've we've put in place the, the payment structures now, and we've figured that out, which has been very complex. And how do we how do we now move to performance? You know, their focus has been building scale and getting that because of the, the drives from our contract with uh, CMMI um, to, to achieve certain scale. So we've been trying to do that. But now I think we're seeing a more of a move to, okay, guys, how is your performance and uh, how are we doing on that? So, um, you know, we are far from there yet, but we are actively working. A large part of what we're doing every day is trying to build that infrastructure to change the delivery of care um, and be able to measure how effective that that changes, those changes are. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I just want to say I really appreciated the presentation. It was very thorough. Obviously, you've thought a lot about this budget and how we move forward. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jessica. We're going to move to member lunch. Robin. Thank you. Uh, and thank again, I'll echo Jess and Kevin's thanks. Um, but I'll jump right into my questions um, to ensure we keep moving time wise. Um, so I was curious about your Medicare reimbursement assumptions of 1.6% and uh, how you took into consideration, if it was possible, the changes to the Medicare sequestration, um, which was eliminated through the end of 2020, and which was, of course, a bigger impact on this budget, but also into uh, quarter, your first quarter of next budget. Sure, so we uh, do not assume sequestration as a long-term uh, budget cut and waiver. And so that was something we brought back into our budget um, <clears throat> effective in uh, calendar 21. <clears throat> we have assumed, um, you know, on average a 1.6% increase um, in Medicare uh, rates. Um, that's on, um, the, the facility side and, and not the pro pro fee side where it's about a half a percent. Okay, great. I don't write this down, I won't remember. So excuse my pause. Um, I also wanted to ask you a little bit more about telehealth on page six of your presentation. You had some information about expanding telehealth um, in the specialty practices. So I was wondering if you could provide a little more um, description or color commentary about uh, how telehealth has changed your operations um, and what impacts you've assumed around telehealth, both in terms of impacts on volumes, but also on your budget reimbursement levels. Sure, so uh, telehealth was something that uh, we had to 
quickly uh, transition to. We did not have and, and still don't have the mature infrastructures to support telehealth. Um, uh, we did use the, the Doxy platform to quickly uh, onboard. Uh, where we saw the most impact in telehealth was in our ca cardiology services and our behavioral health services, uh, where those physicians and those patients uh, were able to align together um, and uh, use that platform to, to provide care. Um, honestly, within um, our women's health services and orthopedic services, uh, those have not really caught on all that well. Um, <clears throat> and so we are looking long term um, uh, to mature our systems uh, more on the, uh, the medicals, the, the cardiology and behavioral health side. That said, um, we're actually more outward focusing uh, in Rutland than we are inward in telehealth. Um, and we've banded together uh, with, you remember Tom Hubner, um, who is helping our community uh, really look to mature telehealth services um, out, outside of the four walls of the hospital and including uh, primary care. In terms of our budget impact, um, we it really is not a significant change. Um, you know, we're being paid as if it is a face-to-face -face visit um, at this point. Uh, but honestly, in terms of uh, those clinic visits, for the most part, we've resumed face-to-face -face volume and that outpatient volume is at about 100% of, of what our base was. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and it, from your presentation, you mentioned um, that you were able to reduce some of your costs for travelers um, and that you've really focused on trying to keep those travelers contracts just for hard to, hard to find skill sets, including potentially OR. Um, how, do you, are you thinking that that's an expense that you can continue to keep down? How are you seeing that transition into the future? Because as we've talked about in the past, travelers are incredibly expensive compared to normal staffing and finding a way to shift from travelers to normal staffing for these functions would obviously be a way to both keep people employed, but also um, keep costs down. Yes, yeah, so uh, this is really led by our chief nursing officer, Betsy Hassan, um, who's done uh, some great work uh, with our um, uh, community um, uh, at, at colleges and, and education systems. Uh, where we saw an increase in travelers uh, to, to begin with is when uh, Castleton moved from a two-year to a four-year nursing program. So there were a couple of years where we just didn't have graduates. We're past that now. Uh, so Castleton can uh, provide, you know, 25 to 30 graduates a year for us. We have a very close relationship with them uh, to make sure that their programs support our needs and that we're both supportive of, of their graduates uh, pre and post graduation. Uh, we've also have a relationship with BTC and their nursing program as well. Uh, where we have uh, done a, a bit of, of work uh, is in growing our own where we have taken LNAs and we are supporting their educational needs uh, monetarily and then their scheduling needs to bring them uh, back through uh, an education cycle so that they can attain their nursing degree um, and that has been uh, particularly helpful. Uh, we see new nurses coming out of colleges really liking our nurse residency program which provides them a kind of a year full uh, coaching and mentorship, uh, that has been helpful. Um, and then of, of late, uh, we have uh, invested in um, an OR training program where we are taking four OR nurses or nurse candidates and putting them through our own training program to be able to expedite uh, hiring uh, those nurses into that practice, which is uh, extremely difficult and competitive. So the short answer is yes, with these programs in place, uh, we feel that uh, we can keep pace with our needs. Um, that coupled with that, uh, you know, the fact that we do see a slight decline in our inpatient volume does help us with that. Great. Well, let me just expand on one thing that Judy mentioned, the OR yeah. training program. Um, this was a novel way of trying to, to 
train people for the highly specialized area of OR nursing. Uh, it is a it is one of the more challenging lifestyle uh, uh, areas for nurses uh, because of the call responsibility. In our size hospital, they have to be generalists and they take a higher degree of call than you would in a larger medical center. Um, so typically it takes us one year of on the job training in the OR to get to train a nurse to be independent and to function in the operating room. Um, and with this uh, novel program, we've taken one of our senior nurse educators, we created an OR simulation laboratory, and in nine months, we can train uh, because of the work and the cooperation of our surgeons and so forth, we can train, we're training four nurses in a period of nine months whereas it typically took one year to train one in a live OR environment. So um, they're getting the simulation environment and then they're bringing them into the OR and it's really, so far it's working out really, really well. So we're very excited about that. That's great, uh, thank you. Um, I just had a couple more questions. Uh, one is about your dish assumptions. So it looks like your uh, dish assumptions are, are pretty much driven by your reduction in volume. Um, I know another federal change was uh, pushing off the dish cuts that were scheduled to happen in 2020 and 2021. So I just wanted to check about uh, whether there were any other assumptions related to that federal change. It's volume driven. Okay. Um, and lastly, um, you mentioned in your in on the slide related to your ACO performance in 2019 um, that your you would have received more fee for service than you did in fixed payments. Do you have any sense of what was driving that variance? So you know our feeling is uh, looking at those care management practices and. Uh, allowing uh, patients to engage with care providers before they need emergent uh, ER services. Uh, we do see, um, you know, a heightened use of, of ED in our cohort of patients. And um, that is one of our, uh, you know, front running um, strategies uh, as we work with uh, primary care, uh, both the FQHC and our private physicians here. Um, we also uh, do offer services that other communities don't offer. Our opiate service um, and our behavioral health services do have an impact to our cost of care here. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Next, we're going to move to member Pelham. Tom? Thank you, and uh, I want to add my applause to um, those that have come before me about the job that you're doing. You can. As I listen to you, I can uh, viscerally feel the connection between the leadership at the hospital and the numbers that they're presenting and the stories behind the numbers that, you know, all their nuances. So congratulations. Um, that, uh, um, one of your, your reduction in NPR 2021 over 2020 is the second most severe of the 14 hospitals at 7.6%. And, um, you know, it's you know your your Medicaid Medicare is down eight percent despite the the, the, the uh, charge increase. Medicaid down one point six percent. Commercial down nine point two percent. So you've got some headwinds in front of you. Um, and I'm just and Judy mentioned uh, areas that are near and dear to me to try to find a path to help solve the uh, cost shift and pair mix. I'll leave volume aside for a minute, but the, you know there's the there are those issues, the uh, net to gross dropping from 45.8% down to 42.8%. And I'm just wondering when you, when you foresee, if you can lift your heads up just a little bit, when do we hit the breaking point where these structural forces in, health, in funding health care in Vermont uh, just uh, don't work anymore? So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let Claudio uh, comment too, but I, I would say we're there, um, that we have put our best foot forward in this budget. 
Um, we have cut discretionary spending to the extent that we can. We've taken out FTEs and uh, have really demanded that uh, staff take on more responsibility and change some workflows. Um, unless we see some type of uh, re relief, um, if we are held to uh, living on rate increases through the commercial insurance, um, we will have to look at programs. And, and it is as simple as that. Um, <clears throat> we tried, you know, and, and put together a budget that I, I believe we can live with, but this is our third year and really looking at our cost structures and um, it, it, it will not be attainable in future years. Thank you. I mean, to me, it's most disappointing because you look at your track record over the last five years and you, you've done great on very small charge increases, but, uh, you know, you've been positive on operating margin, you know, five of the last five years. And, uh, you know, the seven tenths of 1% that you're looking at for 2021 is, 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 is quite meager. Um, quick question. So can, I, on can I just add to that, Tom? Um, that is, and I, and I just want to throw this into the conversation wherever I can, 340B is critical to Vermont hospitals. It is critical. And that's on operating money. Um, so you're, you know, you, you referenced that your, your 2021B cost structure is down 12.7 million. And I'm just uh, wondering quickly about what efficiencies that you have developed in, 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 the, in those savings and which of those might carry forward into 2022. Um, one of them I heard reference were the travelers and I'm, a uh, question I won't ask is how are things going with Castleton because you've already answered it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm just wondering if there are other areas where um, you've made changes in terms of cost savings that you view as permanent. Sure. So Travelers uh, by far is uh, one of the most significant changes. Uh, then I'll speak to our revenue cycle where we are really trying to leverage IT systems um, to move through those processes a bit more electronically and more efficiently. And um, we were able to cut a number of staff out of uh, uh, the revenue cycle. And when I say revenue cycle, you know, that's the front end of scheduling prior auth registration and then the back end coding billing um, and so really leveraging systems uh, for that uh, we were able to look at services provided in our clinics um, and streamlining uh, some efficiencies there again with patient intake um, outtake those types of things um, within our um, you know clinical services We've uh, looked at merging some responsibilities uh, within imaging um, and uh, in oncology uh, with some of that administrative support. Um, on the inpatient nursing side, you know, we really have not cut staff uh, too, too much there. Uh, we did, there are a handful of nurses uh, that we were, uh, uh, you know, did eliminate, but they weren't necessarily patient facing. So we've tried to really make sure that we didn't step back on our care to our patients there. <clears throat> and so my, my final question is um, just per chance, per chance that uh, you're wrong on the Medicaid number and uh, you know, uh, they give you a 2% rate increase, which my rough numbers say is probably worth a, about a million dollars in NPR to you. It's my rough numbers um, could be off by quite a bit. Um, but I'm just wondering if, if you had an extra million dollars, where would that fall in your income statement? Or would you let it, you know, in terms of an expense uh, item uh, line, or would you let it fall to the bottom line and to increase your margin? We try to bring it to the bottom line at a 0.7% bottom line, given our performance over the past several years. Uh, you probably know better than I do from with your finance background, Tom, that's unsustainable. And uh, we, we don't know if we pushed it too much, I mean, we were very cons we have been very concerned about the cost shift and the fact that the only people who are paying this are the private businesses and the folks that are providing health insurance for their folks. The government payers are not participating. And that is unsustainable at the, you know, unless we, you know, that's why one of the reasons why we're interested in 
um, uh, value-based payment delivery reform, that is unsustainable and it's getting, every year it's getting worse. And one of the questions is, you know, we are very cognizant and very concerned about the local business community and their ability to withstand this next six months of very challenging times. The service economy, especially here in Rutland County, we don't want to make it any harder for our local businesses to be able to employ people and keep their doors open. But the fact of the matter is, um, you know, we've, we maybe have been too conservative because whether Rutland Regional gives passes on a 6% rate increase, charge increase, or a 12% charge increase, uh, I don't know if at the end of the day if our local businesses are going to get any relief out of that. Um, so, you know, that's the challenge. Uh, and all we might be doing is impacting our healthcare infrastructure, which is going to be also critical for our community to recover, and also the economic impact that we get by bringing federal funds into Vermont um, and making sure that those patients can get their care here in Vermont and we're not exporting it to New Hampshire or Massachusetts or, or um, New York. So, you know, I think we're, your point is uh, we're at the tipping point, as Judy said, today. Well, I'll just put a, a fine point on that by saying that if you look at across all hospitals in this exercise, um, the fact is that the Medicaid NPR is down um, across all hospitals. So it's not just you. You know, the, the sum total of, of Medicaid NPR is a negative. And I think a systematic structural problem. Um, but thank you again very much. And I'll toss this back to Kevin. So, so Tom, I, I would just add that um, we've probably already spent the million. Um, after we put our budget together, uh, we were presented with the cost for the negative pressure in our ICU and then expanding our laboratory testing from curbside to a permanent testing with additional equipment. Um, and if you remember those costs, we have not borne into our budget at this point. So one, one final quick question. Have you been in touch with your local delegation um, about the cost shift and how critical the cost shift issue is to your survival? We're, we're, uh, we have a legislative meeting with them uh, this afternoon, and we'll make sure we bring it up, Tom, um, before they go back into session again. We just want to give them an update on what's going on at the hospital. Well, thank you both again very much. It's a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Member Yusufer, Maureen. Uh, thanks. Um, just to talk about... Um, you know, the discipline and hard work that and the thoughtful approach to your presentation. Um, you particularly the focus on all the financial statements, which you walked us through, which I think was very helpful. And your focus on expense management um, really comes through um, your financials. Um, I just have a couple. Of, um, the first is one of the options that we had for the commercial rate increase was to look at a piece of it potentially Potentially being as, as related to COVID, is that maybe we're going to impact 2021, but could possibly come back in 2022. And just want to understand why you didn't parse out some of the 6% increase that you asked for into this COVID, because you specifically did talk about that some of the inpatient issues were related to social distancing requirements that would curb the volume and you know hopefully we're going to get through this and and um when we get to 2022 some of those things may come back and you also talked about whether it was between 90 to 95 percent of volume tracking that you're looking at right now so just want to get a little bit of understanding about that because it also could give us time to all look at you know, we'll, we'll know at the end of the year what really happened and whether or not, you know, things are coming back uh, and whether some of that rate increase could potentially be a temporary. And so, so uh, uh, Maureen, uh, Judy can give you the, the, the technical specific answer, but, but I also just want to say re respectfully, you know, we can parse this budget out any way, you know, that we think is more helpful for you as a regulator or for, you know, the, the, politics of this or so forth. However, I, I just want to stress how incredibly um, uh, 
taxed, our finance, our whole operational team, our executive team, and our finance team has been. So, you know, in addition, over this past six months, to making sure that we had uh, the liquidity position, uh, accessing lines of credit, making sure we had cash flow, making sure we were accessing Medicare advance payments, state CARES funding with a thousand page application, federal CARES funding, several uh, tranches of that, making sure that our frontline employees could benefit from the state uh, CARES fund hazard relief program, putting together a budget in an unprecedented time of uncertainty, you know, just trying to find where the bottom was back in February and March and April when the whole financial floor was falling out of the hospital and getting us back and then working on some strategic planning as we look at recovery um, and, and looking at, you know, of those 40 FTEs, of those 40 employees that we laid off, a number of them came from the revenue cycles there. So I just want to just make sure that you understand the picture of as an independent uh, community hospital, we just have some limited bandwidth on some of these areas. And we've, I think, uh, you know, we've really been stretched to just try to make sure we're still in the game. So I, I don't um, mean to push back by any points, but I just want to uh, I, I just want to respond that we've been under a considerable burden on, on where we've been in finance. So, Judy, I'll let you answer the actual question. And so the short answer is that, you know, we think this may be the new norm. And the impact in COVID is so intrusive through the organization at all levels. I don't know how we would have parsed out a portion of ongoing operating expense uh, and, and request versus what's just COVID related. Um, because within each, you know, if you look at our lab volume, our lab volume is growing at, you know, extraordinary paces. Uh, OR surgery is down. Um, so it, it would have been extremely difficult to break out. And in the end, um, I don't think it would have gotten us any to, to any different place or result. Um, and to be truthful, we are trying to understand what the new normal is. Um, the vaccine is, you know, we're talking about it, it's a ways off. Um, and then we've got to understand who would even accept a vaccine and how long that process is going to take. So I think this is the new norm for at least the next couple of years. And, and you know, I really appreciate all the backups you want to support, you know, where your NPR is. But I also just question um, whether or not it's, it's still a little bit conservative. Um, of all the 14 hospitals, you're the only hospital that's requesting lower NPR than 2019. Um, when I kind of do a lot of back of the envelope, and I know you're building it from the bottom up, clearly, but if, if you look at the you know budget you had for 2020, which was 268, to multiply that by 0.95, which is what you're saying the utilization would go to, at 8 million 52. When you look at the fund rates that you're projecting at 62 million, multiply that out by four, um, and then add eight. Um, your your well. Oh, over stop 200. a second, Maureen. I think Kim's trying to. Uh, we've been having some difficulty each time you begin to speak hearing you and. Kim, is that uh, what you were trying to say? It is, yes. I was just interrupting. Okay. I wasn't understanding everything. So I'm not sure. Oh, it's a great connection I get up here in Colchester. So I'll try to project a little bit more. But, you know, life well, is dicey in a bunch of different. So if I take the million hot in the fourth quarter, projected times four plus eight, that's 256 million. If I look at third and second quarter with the second quarter hits that you had multiplied by two at eight, you know, you get to 260. So um, I, I just, you know, kind of on the lines where, where Jess was looking at as well, it, it just appears that um, you may have some more upside in the volume uh, in your NPR. And um, so, just, just, so can I, can I, I know you've already that? talked about that, but just would really, sure. So it is really risky for you to take high level uh, performance and apply, uh, um, you know, 
volume trend uh, percentages. Um, you said it best when you said this budget is built from the ground up, and that is true. And we have to look at the services that are growing and the services that we think um, are shrinking. And when we look at uh, orthopedic, primarily, not, not all, but when we look at inpatient surgical procedures, they provide more contribution to margin than an increase in lab volume. And you have to understand your business like that to be able to bring all of these assumptions together. Um, I will tell you that I'm worried that we're gonna attain our volume. Um, as we sit here today, we had 77 patients in house on average in July. Our budget uh, gets us to what, 80, 84. Um, I don't know where we're gonna get that growth. We're still volatile. The last 17 months or 17 days in July, our revenue was three and a half million dollars more than the first 17 days in August. So we are still in a very volatile state um, that is really predicated on um, patients feeling safe coming in and our capacity with social distancing to care for these patients. Um, I, I would, uh, you know, love to share with you at a deeper level our assumptions on service related, um, but to take very high level percentages and apply them to past year, um, that it, it is not, um, it's not reality um, and it would not uh, give you uh, numbers that um, are valid just because of the change in services. No, and I, and I appreciate that you're doing it from the bottom up, obviously. Um, it is interesting to note that you are the only hospital forecasting below 2019 levels um, with the fourth highest increase in commercial asks. So, um, you know, just, just from a relative position, and, and you may be right, and, and everybody else may, maybe is going to be tracking, you know, differently um, as well. So, um, just one other question on when, when you look at the detailed charts of the hospital data entry, and I'm not sure if you, if, on the budget session, there's a line with other reform payments in 2021 of negative 15 million, and that's impacting your NPR to bring it down to 247. I don't know if you have that chart or if that was generated by the Green Mountain Care Board staff. Um, I do not have that chart, um, I, and I never like to um, assume I know what you're looking at, um, but it sounds like that that is the shadow uh, payment uh, related to the ACO volume um, and the fact that we're receiving fixed payments. But um, again, I, I can I can work through that with you if you. If yeah, you it may be related to that, and I guess um, how does that work? Are you recording it? Because because you have 15 million in fixed prospective payments, and then you have a negative 15 million, which which may be the shadow payment reduction. But it's neg, you know, the the combination of those two is is negative, and so are you also including that up above in your in a different place in the gross patient revenue as well, and then you're adding it back in fixed. Yeah, so if you recall our slide on uh, the ACO, uh, we are assuming uh, that we are still going to be running behind uh, fixed payments to fee for service by about $300,000 for the Medicaid population. Yeah. I guess maybe we could go through where you put it, because typically everybody puts their NPR and then they traditional fee for service and then add in the fixed payment um, to that. And you guys do that and then you take out the entire fixed payment amount of 15 million or above that even, uh, which would then get you up to 262. And I just wanted to make sure you look at that as well because it, it almost seems like you're taking out the shadow payments. So I, I can assure you our net revenue numbers um, all include um, any uh, any transactions with the, the ACO, so. Okay, um, but maybe we can follow back up on, Absolutely. maybe it's being tracked up above as well as, as taken below. Um, and let's see. 
And on your pension plan, the elimination of the $2 million this year, um, I guess, you know, what is your status of your funding for that? Will that return next year? And and um, just want to make sure, I guess you did say it's not obligated to do that, but it's been something you do each year. Yes. Yeah, so uh, another proud moment for uh, Rutland is the management of our pension program. Um, we have really held up the fiduciary responsibility uh, through our investment advisory committee, through our actuaries. Um, and so we didn't lose any ground in COVID because we have um, an asset liability uh, matching policy. Um, and if you look at our pension program, we are consistent at about 95% funded. Uh, we're considered a model program. Um, okay. So for us, it was riskier to funnel that $2 million to pension um, and away from capital or away from needs, um, and that was the consideration. This will be a decision we make uh, each year based on uh, the economics and based on um, where we are in terms of needing available cash flow. Um, I just just also did want to compliment when I looked at the 2019, you know, on the NPR, um, you're one of the very few hospitals that are below on the expense from 2019 as well. So I really appreciate uh, the effort you put into all the cost savings that you put into your plan uh, to align with um, where you think the NPR is going to be. So that's all I had. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. If I could just add, just to be clear, we've always um, tried to play it straight um, with, you know, the and and with an appropriate level of conservatism, but follow the guidelines and so forth. So I just want to be absolutely clear: we're not trying to sandbag our our budget this year on NPR. We wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, let go, laid off permanently, forty of our associates and done all those other very painful cost cutting things if we did not believe that this was a game changer and we were gonna and we needed to take some of those matters into our own hands and just rely on rates to to save save the day for us. I, so I just, you know, I hope you hear that that um, I hope you're right, Maureen. I hope maybe we uh, we are we do better than we project. Uh, that would be a great uh, very helpful for us in, in in our recovery. But Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I I I know you're you know, obviously putting in, in the best that you can for NPR and uh, no, if anything, um, people go, go the other way, you know, put higher numbers into NPR. So I know you've put a lot of discipline into that. Um, I think, you know, from what Jess had expressed and what I did, and I know we're doing it very simplistically, um, it, it may need another, you know, just so a little more reconciliation from the bottom up um, looking at that. But uh, no, I, I don't think you're trying to misrepresent where your NPR is at all. Thanks. Thank you, Maureen. And I, we're really falling way behind, but I do have a couple of uh, questions to ask before I turn it over to the healthcare advocate. Um, in you, is your um, self-insured um, program for your employees participating in the model? Yes, it is. Great, thank you. And. Um, do you feel strongly that all the different community partners are working together to drive down your total cost of care, specifically the FQHC, VNA, DA, et cetera? Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, we are seeing uh, more cooperation and collaboration with those other key partners um, than we have his, in, you know, I think uh, we're at an unprecedented level of that. I think everybody is committed to working together and putting the interest of the community ahead of the interest of any one of our organizations, Kevin. I think there's a real spirit there. Good. And um, you'd mentioned uh, a decline in psych reimbursement, and one of the uh, key factors in Rutland um, making that initial move to have inpatient beds was to make sure that over time, the state adequately reimbursed them for care that was given in that unit. Was this an expected decline in psych reimbursement or talk to us about that? Uh, it was not. Um, and so in terms of the unit, uh, they are keeping us whole. This decline uh, was 
for holding patients in our ED awaiting care. Um, and we were reimbursed uh, regardless of where that patient uh, ultimately was placed in, in care. Uh, at this point, we're only um, reimbursed for patients that are awaiting care in our own facility, uh, which is a, a smaller part of the ED population. Okay, you mentioned that, um, you know, you were looking at 82 inpatient uh, occupancy and that July was only at 77. Is that in line with traditional seasonality or is it still below where you would like it to be? It's below. Okay. And um, who are the members of your investment advisory committee and are they both, is it the same committee on your pension and your other investments? Yes, it is. So who are the members? So, uh, former CFO, uh, Ed Orgazalik. Um, so he uh, has uh, sat on the committee uh, since since retirement. Uh, Margot Jones, who um, is an investment advisor here in town. Uh, we have Dr. Tim Daly, who is um, an anesthesiologist uh, here in town. Uh, we have Brian Nolan, who uh, is uh, an HR professional and VP uh, in, in the community. Um, who am I missing? Uh, Mike Salamano, the president Sal of uh, Killington Resorts. Yes. Um, and, and that committee uh, is partnered with a very uh, solid relationship with our actuaries and um, our investment advisor, uh, Vanguard. You know, it's, it's refreshing to hear after we just went through a, a rate review process where um, we saw what happened to 58 and a half percent of the uh, assets in the uh, one of the insurers pension. So um, hopefully you keep up doing that good work and hopefully at some point there's some type of year where that would give you the type of ability just to um, fund it higher and take it right off your books completely. But um, those are just hopes. Um, uh so that you was actually a strategy, Kevin, and uh, we backed off on that uh, because of the need to fund at about 110 percent. But that is definitely within our five-year plan. Well, as Annie would say, there's always tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, talked about operating margin, and uh, again, we really appreciate the 0.7 percent. But Claudia, you talked about a goal being two and a half percent. We've seen others that have argued for a higher um, normal operating margin. Um, what's your basis on falling on that 2.5 for being where you would regularly want to be? Well, we feel that's where we need to be to uh, get back to um, replacing our uh, facilities and plant and equipment at uh, 1.2 uh, times uh, depreciation. We feel that's where we need to be to back, um, try to provide additional not required funding for our uh, pension so that we can hopefully exit from that um, and uh, make sure we're meeting our debt service uh, and other obligations and not have to go into uh, our investments and preserve our balance sheet. So that's kind of where the minimum we need. I mean, to be healthy, you know, three, three and a half percent is probably where we'd like to be. But you know, for this coming year, I mean, for the, you know, for the immediate future, if we can get back to two and a half percent, we would be uh, happy and feel like that's a fiscally prudent uh, level to be at. Okay, let me ask a couple of quick questions on workforce and we'll turn it over to the healthcare advocate. Um, with Castleton not going back to um, in-class um, sessions, are you fearful that um, some of the clinical training um, may go elsewhere? Um, for some of the nurse uh, students there? No, I don't think so. Uh, our chief nurse executive, uh, Betsy Hassan, has been meeting um, with their leadership in, in the nursing program. And that is one of the uh, few things that they're gonna be doing in person is the nurse training program. So uh, those nurses, and we've made arrangements for them to do their clinical experience here. So I think we're pretty confident that uh, that program uh, for nurses will remain strong at Castleton. So the, the last question I have is really focusing on uh, the physicians. And um, over the last few years, you've seen some retirements. You've got some more coming up. Um, you seem to be confident that you'd be OK without having to go with uh, um, 
traveling docks. And I'm just curious if you're seeing um, anything as far as physicians from other areas um, that are more um, urban in nature, trying to find an escape route to a, a better place to live, namely Vermont. Yeah, we, we have been seeing a little bit of that. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, some unsolicited have uh, showed up and said, hey, do you have any other uh, any opportunities here? So, you know, whether that was a crisis, you know, that was back in um, April and they were uh, this one physician in particular had a vacation co home up here and was uh, downtown in uh, New York City uh, practicing um, and was on kind of a furlough type of a thing. But uh, yeah, I think there's some opportunity. I think there are some people who, with, after going through this crisis in an urban area, uh, are looking for a safe place to relocate and be with their families and 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 still be able to practice and and have an have a uh, full service practice. So, uh, you know, we're trying, we've tried to use this as a matter of fact, to recruit some hard to recruit specialists and target that towards some of the, uh, some of the more urban uh, areas, so. Great. So at this point, I'm gonna to turn to the healthcare advocate. Um, Mike Fisher, who's gonna be conducting the questioning for your team this year? I think it's me today. Okay. Or me with Rutland anyway. Um, good morning still. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. I guess uh, let me uh, let me just start with a, a little bit of a higher level statement about the overall hospital budget process and how we're approaching it this year. Um, maybe I should have said this up front, but here I am. Um, we appreciate that this is a year like no other um, and that our uh, hospitals and other providers let a truck go by. Uh, hospitals and other providers are uh, under extraordinary pressure. Um, the Healthcare Advocates Office is going to take a little bit of a bigger picture um, uh, approach this year. Um, I, we won't be challenging hospitals on, on details so much, and we may not even have questions for every hospital. Um, a year ago, we had planned to come with a stronger tact about uh, hospitals free care and um, free care policies, both about the details of their policies and about their approaches to making sure their patients knew about their policies. Um, then COVID happened and a lot of plans changed. And uh, uh, that's still on my list of something that I, I think is ripe for some focus, but not today. So let me focus on Rutland now. Um, First, uh, thank you, like everyone else, thank you for your presentation and thank you for the work you've done um, and uh, in the COVID crisis. And uh, also, I want to thank you for the work you've engaged in uh, with my office, uh, particularly around your free care policy and your readability of your uh, plain language summary. Um, you are one of the leaders in that effort. Um, similarly, I want to um, I want to give you an opportunity to speak a little bit about um, the, your work on implicit bias training. Um, all I know is what I've read in uh, in the uh, press, um, but um, I, I am we are well aware of racial disparities in healthcare, and uh, I think it's interesting that you guys are uh, approaching that and attempting to attempting to address it. And I'd love to give you an opportunity to speak a little bit about how it came to be. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Mike. Um, you know, as a hospital executive in um, spending most of their career in Maine and Vermont, I always thought that um, issues of diversity and inclusion, you know, we don't have to worry about that because we don't have any diversity and it's not an issue. But that's from the seat of, uh, you know, a white middle-aged cisgender uh, Christian uh, dude. And um, if I was African American, or if I was transgender, or if I was, um, you know, uh, a Muslim, would I feel as comfortable coming to work every day? Would I feel as comfortable going to get care and knowing that the people taking care of me 
uh, respect and understand my background and those cultural differences won't impede how I'm cared for or how included I feel as a member of the workplace. Um, and so this organization started down this road um, a couple of years ago, actually, and really proud of doing that. And as a matter of fact, um, you know, I've just never been in a uh, environment where there's been much diversity. So I haven't been that attu uh, attuned to some of these issues. And so my first uh, implicit bias training was here two years ago, the first year when I was CEO. We did we started that for all managers. And certainly um, the events of this past year and the challenges of this past year have uh, really brought a lot of awareness uh, to these issues and these longstanding issues of bias and systemic racism. And uh, we um, you know we were approached by a group of interested employees about doing more. And we recognize that we need to do more, um, not just fly the flag, um, but what are the backgrounds? More importantly, I think, is what are we actually doing to try to identify um, areas of equity uh, in how we deliver care? Um, you know, are, are people of color getting less access to pain medication when they come in with fractures in the ER, some of those type of things. So we've challenged our, not just doing training for staff to understand these issues better and to appreciate the impact of implicit bias on how we interact with each other, but also to try to start when we do our community health needs assessment this coming year, um, we're taking a lot of cuts on those issues, but can we can we now get the data and can we take some cuts on this on how does homelessness and how does housing affect people from minority populations, not just the whole population? Um, and how are we delivering care? And I've challenged our quality department to start looking at disparities in care and see if we can have some data and start looking at, hey, uh, you know, is what is happening out there and, and how is our ability to deliver, deliver equity of care? So we're doing, you know, we have... Um, Diversity and Inclusion Steering Committee that's that's guiding us in this work, uh, and we are starting to do um, training for all staff, and then also try to do some more uh, more um, objective quality uh, looks at how we're delivering care. Thank you, thank you for that, and thank you for your description of that. This is maybe another yet another place where there's an opportunity for some cross pollination uh, to the whole hospital network. Um, let me turn to testing, COVID testing for a moment. And uh, thank you again for um, for talking about your process and what you've um, what Rutland is doing. Um, I guess I have a, a maybe a policy question. Um, should we be uh, purchasing tests, test kits and lab fees on a statewide basis, bulk purchasing? Is there an opportunity to have uh, maybe much the same way we purchase vaccines today. Is there an opportunity for savings in the system? Um, and is there an opportunity to make sure that we have adequate tests for all Vermonters who feel they need a test to be able to get a test? Yeah, we have been working with um, the uh, um, department, uh, the Vermont Department of Health. Um, I, I know uh, Commissioner Levine has been working at coordinating testing. We've been in contact with uh, the UVM uh, lab, which is you know our biggest lab capability for the for the organization on how we could do that. I, I reached out to Commissioner Levine uh, a while ago to see if there's anything that the state could do to help expedite our ability to access testing materials. Um, the the challenge is that the states are kind of on their own on some of this stuff, right? It's the state doesn't have much more um, ability to influence the ac accessibility of testing and testing supplies, um, you know, than a small state like Vermont does. So I think um, there are some challenges. Theoretically, there would be some, and I think we are trying to um, collaborate with the uh, other hospitals in, in, in Vermont and the health department in coordinating how we're delivering testing. But I think that's might be realistically as good as we can get at this point. Okay. Um, so I, I appreciate uh, how clear you were about how important 340B revenue is for the hospital. I, um, I can see it in your, uh, in your budget documents and, um, and, I, um, and I don't disagree. 
Um, but I did want to say out loud that um, that 340, 340B revenue is a price spread between what people have to pay, rate payers or people out of pocket have to pay, and the 340B price. And um, it puts pressure on other parts of the healthcare system. I, I just felt the need to say that out loud. I, um, it's more of a comment. I'm happy to have you respond. I don't mean to diminish in any way how important the revenue is to you, um, but it's not free is my main point. No, but it's not coming from taxpayer dollars. It's coming, it's built into how kind of the, the drug company has to supply us uh, uh, those medications that reduce costs. Um, and, uh, you know, right now, I agree with you, Mike. I mean, I think if we could provide some more of those discounts to the end users, that would be tremendous. But right now, with the pressures that we have on, the trade-off might be reduced access to services. So, yeah, you know... I'm I'm not that's the I'm challenge not, we're under. I'm not arguing that you should lose the revenue. I'm just recognizing that it's not that somebody's still paying. It. Um, now this is a little bit more of a curiosity for me. I've always been a little bit um, um, it is interesting to me that for your employee health care uh, expenses, you are both a purchaser and a seller. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you say that you you had a, a loss of two point two million dollars in discounts, um, I guess I wanted to poke you a little bit about that. Is it a loss or is it a savings? Is it, I, it, it, it it's kind of on both sides, isn't isn't it? Judy, you, you are, want to take that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so uh, the 2.2 million isn't all entirely our employee health plan. Um, there are some programmatic and structural changes with uh, payment policy changes at Blue Cross. Um, but we have seen an uptick in employees, our own employees using our own services here, um, which we basically cover our costs for. Um, and so that is a, a you know, a, a, a lower reimbursement than if we were uh, covering uh, Blue Cross on the exchange. All right, understood. Um, lastly- and that's back to zero. Yeah, yeah. Lastly, um, I appreciate, want to recognize your statement about um, how rate increases are more and more ineffective. Um, and um, and the prospects of where we're going, uh, I, I, I can't, I, that's going to be more and more true um, from my perspective. Um, I think that um, we are predictable here at the HCA. Um, it will not surprise you that uh, you'll hear us say um, some version of Vermonters can't afford it. Um, and But I did want to say out loud to you that, um, you know, because I don't think Vermonters can afford a 6% or an 8% or a 20% rating, commercial rate increase, um, doesn't mean that I don't think Rutland or any other hospital needs the revenue. Um, and so I, I wanted to make that distinction clearly directly to you, um, but also, um, uh, you know, very much in line. I think the discussion you had in response to some of um, Member Pelham's questions is very much in line with with some of the same uh, point is sort of structurally, what are we doing here and how do we get ourselves out of it? We don't need to repeat that. I just wanted to um, appreciate it, recognize it. And um, thank you. That's mine. That's all the questions I have today. Thank you, Mike. At this point, we're going to open it up to the public for comments on the RRMC budget. Uh, Kevin, it's Ham Davis. Yes, Ham, go ahead. Uh, I just want to, I've got a comment and it's a serious question on the end of it. Um, I've seen, I've been since nine, early 1980s, I've seen something like 150 of these hearings and I'm struck. Uh, both this year and last year, by how rock solid the Rutland uh, presentation was. And so this is a gratuitous piece of advice to uh, uh, Claudio Fort. Somebody's going to try and steal Judy Fox. But other than that, the uh, when you listen to the the uh, the whole of the Rutland testimony, um, it it contained it talked about the Rutland budget, of course, but it also contained some of the most interesting commentary on healthcare reform that I have heard 
uh, from any quarter uh, over the last, say, year. Um, and one of the what so what he, I think I hear uh, Claudio saying is that they that they and that they they understand that the that the uh, that how important the all payer model is that value based financing which I really call capitation um, is um, the thing that I'm curious about though is 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 whether it, what it, he implied by saying how complicated it was. That it's going to take a very long time to get there. I mean, he didn't actually say that, but that was that that was implied. I think. My question is, given the, given the difficulties in the system now, given the whole warning about uh, 340B, which if it went away would drown half the system in red ink. Um, it seems to me I would just ask him why doesn't it make sense to move towards uh, uh, value towards capitation as rapidly as possible. And so my question, because, because once you, because one of the things that I think Judy Fox said was, look, we've got to, we're, we're, we need to increase our volume. Well, the, the, uh, the, the need to be the, the need for an increase in volume is based on a fee for service financing. So given all of that risk, do do you believe? Uh, tell me. My question, I guess, is why twofold. Why don't you believe that you should move there faster? And number two is how fast do you think it would be possible to be? And sort of a third question: If you could, you could you could your uh, business model change if you got not to seventy percent of fixed price contracts, but. <laughs> That's my question. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but what was the last number? Fifty or sixty? Fifty. Five zero. Thank you. Well, yeah, better so answer five, quick before him asks yeah, the fourth one, Claudio. So, um, <laughs> uh, th thanks, Ham. Uh, I will tell you if uh, Judy Fox leaves here, you will see the quality of Rutland's um, budget presentation go on a precipitous decline. Um, uh, she is the backbone and put all this uh, together for us. And she she puts me in front of the screen to be a little bit of a window dressing and just uh, nod my head and agree. Um, but uh, I will I will tell you on, y you know, it's tough because, you know, the old foot, uh, one foot on the dock and one foot in the canoe analogy, uh, you know, as we are progressing towards health care reform, if we could flip a switch and be fully on uh, full value, that would be great in some respects, but in other respects, it is gonna take us time to change how we practice medicine and how we take care of people. And fundamental to everything that we are doing, the doctors tell us and our medical directors is, first, do no harm. And if we, we have to be careful, I think we need a diligent progression, and I think we're on the right path towards a value-based payment. But if we, if we, you know, it's a very narrow, it's a very narrow line to walk. If we do it too precipitously and too quickly and don't give our systems and our care delivery systems the ability to react and change so that we don't harm patients in doing that, uh, you know, we're not going to be successful and we're going to violate our first principle. Um, on the other hand, if we if we drag our feet and we don't continue to progress and move and keep one foot in the canoe and so forth, it is tremendously inefficient because we are trying to manage under two very different systems of care. So I don't have uh, the answers for that. I'm certainly, you know, I'm just trying to keep the lights on here and 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 try to run a, a small hospital here. But um, I think we're on the right track. And I think, uh, you know, I think if we stay the course and continue to try to um, work with this, other than that, what do we have left for health care reform? Coming, coming every year and, and fighting whether five or six percent is the right number um, and, and so forth. I mean, if we don't fundamentally do something different, I, I think we're stuck in this paradigm, which there doesn't seem to be any answers to. Other well, members of the you. public. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Other members of the public? May I ask a question? Go ahead, Dale. Um, I have, I just tuned in. So if this question has been answered, my apologies. Um, 
one question I've had immediately for hospitals is, what do they see as the trends as COVID continues and after COVID? How much is it going to change what the healthcare needs are within the community they are serving? Um, in my mind, that's a good baseline, something I want to get a handle on in terms of what healthcare looks like after COVID and as COVID continues. So they did address it. Of course, they don't have a crystal ball, Dale, but Claudio, maybe a quick uh, response. Yeah, I think part of it is uh, how does society change after COVID? How do our businesses change? How many of our businesses are going to be able to have health insurance? How is our state and federal government going to be able to fund uh, Medicare and Medicaid programs uh, post that? That's going to dictate on, on how health care is going to look probably more than we can do anything in our hos in our in our small hospitals to try to affect that. Um, we're just trying to be here to make sure we are providing care and taking care of people through this and trying to help our community and our business community stay in business and and get through this unprecedented uh, time um, and and be conservative mm -hmm. in doing so and try. Uh, so that that's all I can probably predict on that. Okay, other members of the public. Oh, hey, hearing, hearing no, one more, sorry. Go quickly. <laughs> Hi, it's Mort Wasserman. Quickly, uh, Mr. Ford, I was the, I'm a retired primary care physician. I was delighted to hear you mention primary care in this hospital budget hearing, and you're talking about your partnership with uh, what must be the FQHC, which cares for, looks like, 75% of the patients in your county. How is that? a partnership working to improve your situation and what are the risks of partnership in uh, your situation? Thank you. I'm sorry, Dr. Wasserman, what was your first name? Uh, I go by Mort, M as in Mary, O-R-T, but it's not my real name. Thank you. Yeah. So it's all about, doc, uh, Dr. Wasserman, it's all about primary care and how effective they can be on the front lines and how they manage that and how we work with them to give them the data and so forth. So the, the partnership is going well. I think uh, we have worked more closely with our primary care partners than ever before. Uh, I think the One Care uh, Accountable Care Organization Gives us some um, gives us some financial skin in the game to um, also some incentive there to work more co closely and collabor collaboratively okay. together. I don't think there's any risks from aligning okay. more closely with primary care. I think the risk is on the other end of things. If you are if you're working in silos and you're not coordinating the specialty care or the acute care with primary care, and for that matter, other social services in the community like housing and and the VNAs and all those other agencies, um, I don't think I, I don't think we're gonna we're gonna increase costs and we're gonna decrease quality and certainly coordination of care if we don't do those things. So I don't think there's any risks by partnering more closely with those organizations. I can't stress enough uh, data that uh, no. data to build programs that match patient needs um, is vital. Uh, we are early in the adoption of you know what some would consider big data and sharing that with our care providers in the community um, but certainly uh, there needs to be significant investment of time and resources and money uh, to to get data in the hands of the right individuals uh, and they're not finance individuals by the way they're clinicians to help us develop those programs that are valuable and needed in the community um, okay, other members of the public? At this point, I want to thank uh, Claudio and Judy for an excellent presentation.